All right. And uh, like I was saying, guys, good evening. Um, we're going to hang out for a few minutes and just answer any questions that you might have. But basically, uh, tonight, we're going to spend about an hour and a half um, with uh, with Farm Design founder Aaron Atchison. And so um, he uh, was kind enough to kind of come through and talk to us. So I thought that was really helpful. And uh, basically, he, I asked him just to kind of share some content that he feels like designers will need um, that will be helpful and share a little bit about the process. I told him specifically the, the classes that um, we are, we're packaging design and we're also uh, sort of like digital designers are getting started with digital design or digital illustration, two very similar fields that he's very familiar with and just kind of sharing some content that he thinks will be meaningful for um, both classes is to grasp. Um, we'll hopefully have a little bit of Q&A afterwards. So um, if you have some questions, please have that ready. Um, and it could be anything and everything that you can, that you're interested in. So that's totally okay. Um, no question is too small. So, uh, definitely be open to whatever kind of like strikes you. Um, and then you can ask away. Um, I'll definitely make a couple of comments too about the packaging design class and how it's sort of structured around his methodologies and, you know, just questions that I have generally for him. Um, and then just things that just come to mind that I think um, designers will just generally need starting out. So um, I haven't seen him for a few years. It'll be the first time too. So I'll be like, hey, I haven't seen you for like almost X amount of years, um, but but it's good to connect. And then we'll kind of jump into it. So hopefully you'll have a presentation, great speaker, and we go from there, okay? Um, after that, uh, we'll still have a little bit of time after class to basically, um, follow up on projects, do any reviews, check-ins on the Mickey Mouse illustration for those folks that are still um, tracing the Mickey Mouse illustration. And then for packaging design, hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to review your designs uh, for those folks that got to present, but unable to, for me to kind of do a quick overview. We'll kind of set uh, a little bit of time in the evening to kind of put that together. So that's, um, that's sort of the goals for tonight. And if anything happens last minute, um, you never know. Um, I try not to be too pessimistic, but if we do have any last minute cancellations or technical issues or difficulties and we have to reschedule the, the presentation, then we'll just continue with our projects um, and use this evening for, for lab time, okay? Uh, grades, I already got grading updated too. So um, you guys are doing uh, really good. We got a majority of the class doing fairly well. So thank you guys for putting in the hard work. Um, if you're watching the rebroadcast, um, it's um, there's always time to catch up. I really am starting to reconsider um, not having a late policy in the in the wake of COVID. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you guys have um, some supports, if students have supports on how to catch up and you're just given a little bit of time to uh, catch up on work, it'll get done. So um, I think for, for the future, if we're still doing hybrid or online, I'll probably follow this method because I have more, this semester I have more students um, um, basically uh, passing, um, engaging with the additional supports that I put in place than previous semesters. And that's just more like, you know, just my own assessment but I really feel like it's 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 making an improvement. And uh, typically when there's a little bit of a drop in enrollment, it's normally for like things that kind of haven't been explained or maybe some supports. I have my theories, but all I know is that for, for my classes, um, you guys are doing really good as long as you're informed, updated, and there's an out some type of outreach where it's like, hey, if you're behind, here's how you can catch up. So those combinations I feel have been really helpful and hopefully you felt the same way too. That yeah, you know, professor, you know, when you hit me up on this or you contacted me about that or you just kind of broke down what I need to do, um, it kind of got over the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the discomfort or the, or the anxiety of like talking or emailing you about, about the situation. So um, I get it, I totally see it. And hopefully you feel that you guys feel like, oh yeah, it actually has been pretty comfortable. Um, being a part of the class and kind of like those additional supports if you've implemented have been really helpful. So if you feel that way, a little thumbs up emoji would be great. Um, but I feel like it's been um, a positive one. And um, and yeah, and I think that I'll probably keep that going for the, for the future of my classes. So um, pretty good insights that I'm, I've been gathering um, as I've been modifying some of the things these last few uh, weeks in the semester, so. 
that's kind of where we're at. But on Canvas, everything has been updated. Um, again, if there's something that hasn't been turned in, um, maybe because it didn't upload properly or something did, or maybe something didn't post because of a Wi-Fi issue on your side, um, that's been known to happen too. I, I could have sworn I uploaded it and it was something going on at home Wi-Fi at the time and it just didn't complete. Um, then um, you still have plenty of opportunities to upload and get it into the system too, guys. So um, if there's like an assignment here and there missing, go ahead and you know take some time to get that in. If there's a discussion post that maybe didn't get um, posted, um, that takes literally just like five minutes or so, depending on if it's a, a long recording, uh, but to make a comment and share some opinions, that takes, you know, five or 10 minutes to get your input, maybe maybe fit 10 or 15 if you want to make it a little bit more in depth. But it's been good. And I feel like um, everyone's been doing pretty well, um, pretty well overall with the uh, with that format. So um, definitely take a look at it. But we got some we got some good scores. And if you feel like you're a bit behind, then um, we then I will reach out to those folks that are a little bit behind or watching the rebroadcast and I'll be like, okay, here's how you can specifically catch up and what you can, what you need to do to get those uh, assignments in and how you can input it. So um, that's coming to um, as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. Okay. All right. What time is it? 656. Okay. Um, we are so far so good. I always get a little anxious too when our guests um, may or may not get in on the connection. So let me just take a look at email and see that. And if you have any questions too, guys, go ahead and uh, post them in. So that way we can kind of take a look at it. And I'm going to Uh, open up a couple of decks here so that we can get everything situated. So give me a second and then we'll, we'll get you set up uh, there. So I want to change that really quick and we'll get you set up. Just want to open the deck and get that going there. Okay. And, but yeah, it's definitely been um, a lengthy time too. Um, I was, uh, one of the things that as designers, one of, um, one of the interesting thing about design is that um, obviously my, as my mother-in-law passed away, um, you'll probably find out for those of us that take this uh, field very seriously, or even if you briefly mention it, I think, um, is that um, you always get called to do the design, the design for just about everything related to that. So um, I put to, um, I basically used the time this week to put together the, um, like the funeral booklet. And I'll, sh I'll share that with you. Um, it was a, it was an interesting process. Um, to do that, to do that, but um, I really felt like, as um, as as a designer, one of the one of the kind of the most fulfilling things you can do is um, is to basically like kind of offer your your expertise in things like weddings. Those are fun. So if if, if you ever get an invitation to do a wedding invite, that's help. You know, that's always kind of cool. Um, birthdays you'd be surprised how many people when you tell them you take after you take this class they're going to ask you for like a laundry list of things can you do my kids this or can you invite our invite or can you design this and i really want it to look like that and um um yeah it's been a bit of a process so uh, it was definitely an honor to kind of put together the booklets and send it off to print but if anyone's ever sent anything to print or for production that could be a little bit of a headache too when you have so many uh hands in the in the editing so if you've ever designed a booklet or or even an invite and people are, are um, giving you information, it's like it's never done. So I had one of those moments. So I had like a flashback from like my my uh, my uh, design studio days where it was like two minutes to send it to the printer and it wasn't done yet. So I was like, oh boy, like I hope, um, yeah. So I hope that it's, uh, <laughs> uh, 
you don't have to experience that in terms of like lateness and whatnot, but hopefully you have an opportunity to kind of like share your skills um, with with loved ones. And so it was very cool to kind of like design, uh, to put together the designs. All right. Um, I think we got Aaron here. Um, I would say before, yep, that's Aaron. Um, I would say before uh, we let him in, um, InDesign or Illustrator, it's, I would say InDesign if you're really comfortable linking files, Matt, but if, um, but if you are not as comfortable with it, then I would probably say go with, um, with Illustrator, but then that, that could also have its own setback. So, um, it depends on what you're most comfortable with. So. All right, guys, I'm going to let Aaron in. So if you feel super comfortable and want to hit your cameras and say hi, go for it. I'm going to let him in right now. And we'll see. There he is. Hey, Aaron, how, how are you, sir? Thanks for joining us. It's uh, really good to have you. And um, we do, yes, we do do a little bit of background music here in class. So. <laughs> Fun. But uh, thanks for joining us. It's it's good to see you, and I know it's been a it's been a while since we've spoken. So, um, super super want to say thank you first of all for joining us. Um, we are uh, um, definitely um, uh, fans of the Do Good Work site or your uh, YouTube page, and um, and just want to say hi, man, and how and how you doing. <laughs> And how are things yeah, going on your side? Good to see everyone. There's a there's a lot of boxes here, <laughs> which is oh, pretty cool. I think the audio so, is giving us a little bit of issue there. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Miguel, let's see. Can you guys? Uh, can we hear Aaron by any chance? Miguel. Yeah. I can oh, let me double check. A... Oh, it is me. Look at that. <laughs> uh, it is me. Let's see. Check one two. Testing. Okay, I can hear. I can you. hear you fine. Okay, cool. My apologies. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah, and so let me go ahead and admit a few folks here. But it's um yeah, thanks for joining us. And um, if my audio goes out again, then I'll definitely make a quick adjustment to it. But um, but how are you? How are things going? We're really good. Um, Probably since last time I saw you, I, I now am a father, so I have a, a kid running around. So that is probably one of the most exciting, I guess, best things I've ever done in my life is be able to create that little guy. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I guess we're all kind of going through similar things. I see we're all on video chat, like who video chatted a year ago, right? Yeah. So sure. I think we're all, all just making adjustments and... Um, yeah, just uh, adjusting and moving on. So, yeah, all all is well. That's good. Um, same here. Um, since we last spoke, uh, I also uh, got married. I, uh, I have a little guy, four year old. Right. And um, yeah, that was uh, I I uh, I had a I I am trying to keep up. I'm definitely hitting more espressos these days uh, to keep up with the four year old. But it, yeah, it's been great and. Um, yeah, so I've had a little one too, and we've been adjusting, and um, and yeah, going online and teaching online too, and um, this is like the first semester that uh, we uh, that the college was offering packaging design, Ooh. and so they called up, they reached out to me, and they're like, hey, uh, would you be interested in kind of like doing the hybrid course? And I'm like, I've never done that before, but um, what do you envision? And Basically, they were saying, well, you would kind of, you know, have two classes meet simultaneously online and um, you can kind of design it and flow it however way you want. Um, but in my research and kind of going back to my like sort of, you know, uh, college days and thinking about just the process, um, one of the first people I thought about was you. And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to just like see if, you know, if Aaron had any reference information. And so when I landed onto your YouTube page, I almost practically kind of like altered everything to reflect that your process. Wow. So your videos have been really, really helpful. Um, tremendously helpful in sort of guiding the, the process. Uh, your staff, your team have been, um, yeah, all their insights have been really instrumental. And I feel like, like the, well, 
I mean, the students can say for themselves, if you guys feel like you're getting a lot of value just from this hybrid combination slash also, you know, um, Aaron's um, teachings, because he's literally teaching, then um, I feel like they've really gotten a lot of value out of it. So I want to just thank you for, uh, for doing do good work and, um, and for making those, uh, making those videos and, um, you know, even being on the future as well. That's been, you know, those interviews have been really insightful. I don't know, man. I just, um, I, I, after CSUN, I was like, you know, I really, you know, I really wanted to keep, um, you know, just, you know, see how you're doing and, and just follow along and see the work that you've been doing. And it's just been fantastic. It's been phenomenal, the work you've been doing and you deserve every credit that you've received. I really do uh, honestly mean that. Yeah. No, it's been a, it's been a journey. I, I've learned so much during, I guess, my journey from graduating, I guess, I guess being in the same shoes you guys are now trying to, you know, learn your craft, uh, try to hone your skills and then try to take that into a career. And I, I've been doing it for, gosh, I'm going to date myself here, uh, over 25 years. And so it's been awesome. I, I'm, I'm glad of the, the path that this has taken me. And um, I've learned so much through this. And I think the lessons that I've learned is sort of helped guide not only me as an individual to grow, but it's allowed me to, I guess, uh, learn skills to grow my business and to teach others. Um, and I think I, I attribute so much of, I guess, my success, and it's different for everyone. My success, success is based on a lot of my failures. And I think that's why I enjoy being able to speak with you guys and be able to create content like Do Good Work. And it's just to be able to share the failures and successes that I have had as, a, as an individual, as a business, um, to help you guys learn and grow as you guys move forward. Because it's something I wish I had when I was in your guys' shoes. Um, and so basically today is I'm here for you guys. Um, I see there's, a, I mentioned there's a lot of boxes here. I can do the math. I'm pretty good at math. That's 22, it's 22 people here. That's including myself. So this is a pretty good sized class. Um, so I want you guys to know I'm here for you. Uh, this is not me wanting to like pound my chest and show you all the great work we're doing, unless you guys want to see that, but I'm here to be able to answer questions you guys might have that like, I know I had a million questions when I was where you guys were. I just didn't know where to go to ask. And there wasn't uh, this thing called the internet when I was in college. And so now we have like this plethora of information and the ability to connect um, through technology. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm here for you guys. I'm so, and awesome. there is nothing off limits. You can ask me anything and I will answer it. So I see like a lot of the, uh, the microphones are checked off. I know that's because there'd be a lot of noise, but um, if there's any questions along the way, I, I encourage any, everyone to like interrupt me and say, you know, ask me a question, ask me to clarify something, um, to ex expound on it a little bit more. Um, so it's, it's not about me, it's about you guys. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Um, and I know we're kind of going a little bit, you know, um, organically here. So was there any, uh, was there stuff that you wanted to share or anything of that sort or, or a deck or anything of that sort that maybe you had in mind? If not, then we'll, do we'll totally just dive in and go questionnaire. But I was just curious to know if there was anything that maybe you wanted to share. Uh, no, sometimes I, we have guests that have something, sometimes they don't. So I just wanted to just double check. Yeah, no, I... I have a bunch of content that I, I had opened up that maybe if there's a conversation then I can share some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really wanted to like figure out, uh, you know, what you guys want to know and then maybe that'll lead us down a path and maybe there's a deck or something I can share with you guys to sort of shed a little light on things. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. So I think the number one thing is like when you're doing lectures or speaking, the number one thing you need to know is you need to know your audience. So I think you helped me get a, a little insight on who you guys are. So where is Rio Hondo? Let, let me ask that first of all, because I've never heard of Rio Hondo. Okay, so um, so we're in uh, in the city of Whittier, so kind of like uh, city of industry outskirts. So we're off the two ten freeway. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I in Pasadena. So I do I teach at Rio Hondo Tuesday Thursday nights. Um, it's a part time uh, teaching uh, position. And, um, but I also teach in Pasadena. I actually am still teaching, uh, I've been teaching high school for like 10 plus years in like graphic arts and engineering, um, kind of blending like CAD um, in that. And so, 
Um, Rio had a couple of positions available. And so from Pasadena to Rio is where we're at. But we're located off the 210 freeway about 30 minutes um, outside of uh, Pasadena, if that makes sense, near 605 in the two, excuse, excuse me, 605 freeway. Um, so 210 to the 605 uh, is where we're at. So about 30 minutes, is I would say. Like, is it a two year? Is it a junior college? Yeah, we're a junior college, two okay. year. And so um, students that we serve are predominantly Hispanic. Um, and, um, and they've been around for, for many, many years and the college has been slowly like expanding, growing and kind of advancing its facilities, but we've always had like a really small graphic design program. And within the last like two or three years, um, it's sort of slowly been expanding. And, um, the last two, three years, we've started to offer night classes, um, for graphic design. And so I was part of that team. Um, they asked, I said, sure. And so we have one uh, digital illustration teacher, which is myself. We have one graphic designer, digital imaging teacher um, on, in the team. Um, and then we have like a full-time uh, teacher that kind of um, teaches all the different units during the day. But the night classes are, are slowly growing and expanding. And, um, and a lot of our students, and you guys can share that as well, um, are working during the day um, or part-time and you know taking classes at night to um, get into the four-year university, do two years to save um, on the cost, transfer to a four to four year, get their four, their degree. Sometimes we, we also offer certificates. So sometimes students do two years, get an associate or certificate or certificate, and then they jump into the field after that. So um, we have a, a big breath. And then some students are returning and taking the class to kind of sharpen their skills. And they're already in the field or they're freelancers or they are um, already working in a studio and they just want to brush up on some of their, um, you know, uh, Adobe Creative Suite uh, techniques. So we have a we have a good breadth of students in the class. Would you say the majority of the students here are focused on, say, illustration, some sort of dipping their toe in the water and sort of graphic design? What are you mainly comprised of? You did. I know you say it's a hybrid, but it's sort of a mixed bag. Well, I'll have you guys, I'll have the class kind of jump in. Let's, let's kind of have you guys contribute. So what do you guys, um, uh, what, what are you guys working on right now? Packaging and, and illustrations. If you want to type it in the chat, feel free. Um, but um, what have, where have we, where have we, been, where have we been living guys? Mostly for these last few weeks, program wise, I would say. Yeah. Curious, cause I'm not an illustrator. I, I, I took illustration classes to get my degree, but I was never, it was never my focus. And so I was more, I, I started out in, in architecture. I studied architecture for almost four years. Um, then I transferred to uh, communication arts, which is what, you know, graphic arts. Um, so I don't really have an illustration background. Um, so I'm just curious how many of you guys are illustration focused? And is that illustration more art related or is it more like commercial art focused? And it may be really early to tell because I just remember like I, I didn't really know what I was doing when first couple of years of school either. So, um, well, feel free to jump in, guys, and, and unmute if uh, that way you can set it up. I feel like I can talk forever on the topic, but or you could type it in the, the chat there. Chris, you're saying what's the difference among those? Okay. Well, my name is Jesse. Thank you very much for being here and joining us. Um, my background is not in um, in this digital design per se, but um, as, uh, my full time job is um, making maps, um, cartographic um, output, and those are vector uh, products. And that's why I I always wanted to attend an Illustrator course in the evening because I work full time. Obviously, so I'm glad that this program is available, and uh, I'm here to learn um, the, not only the program, but also it could also launch me into another um, side career as well, because um, I do love my craft, I love what I do, but uh, I believe um, Illustrator and um, Photoshop and or some other Adobe products can really enhance the cartographic output that, that is generated. Awesome. So I'm not sure, is, it, is there like people can like do is there a little notation annotation they can put on their screen where like I'm an illustrator and they can click like a star or heart? Um, yeah, yeah, we could do like a little emoji there. Um, so like illustrators, can you, is there some way to do some sort of mark so I can 
or, yeah, if you, or I'm looking at the chats, I could see that too. I just want to get a sense of like how much of your illustrators, how much are focused on design. Um, yeah, there's a little thumb. How much, put a thumb up if you are illustration focused. So I just see you popping up. Okay, so I got about four, five, six. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. And of those that did their thumbs up, are you in illustration to be more art forward? Or do you envision that that would lead into some sort of a career, like more commercial type of art? And I, I think if um, Chris, you said, what's the difference between among those? I'm, uh, so like artists, like I have art on the wall, which is like beauty and it's, uh, it's aesthetic and it pleases me. Um, I think that's more of like a classic artist. And if you can take your art form and you can use it in a commercial manner, like designing a map, uh, like Jesus mentioned, or designing infographics or designing illustrations that may go on a bottle, that would be commercial art. Um, so of those who did our artists or illustrators, how many of you know you wanna be sort of a commercial artist? So I thought like six there. Otherwise, I'm gonna assume you wanna be like more of artistic, like I wanna paint pretty pictures. Okay. Okay, so now I'm wondering how many of you wanna be, are interested in commercial art, like graphic arts, branding. And that's what we do. And so obviously I know a lot about that. I'm just curious um, if you guys are interested in that. Cause you're saying you just started a, the course is the first course you're offering at Rio Hondo. So this is like a lot of students probably don't even know this course exists, right? Yeah, they're, they're, they're starting, they're literally starting like, this is like their first ever like illustrator course. And then they can go into like Photoshop in the next uh, section or they're doing it at the same time. Okay. But I saw a lot of thumbs for, uh, for branding and design. So that's great. Okay. I think maybe a good thing to start out here is I can maybe share a little bit of my history and the course I've taken to sort of get to where I'm at, wherever I'm at. Um, and I think what it can be enlightening because I think there could be lessons learned from that. And I always go back to like, I, I wish I knew this when I was your age. <laughs> when I was 20, I wish I knew this or I wish someone could have sort of shepherded me or mentored me and, and taught me this. So this is a deck, I, I was digging something up earlier today to sort of, um, if there was some content. And this is a deck that I did back in 2019 um, at CSUN. And so I think it'd be really relevant for you guys since you're, you're really just um, uh, honing your craft, starting to sort of, you're kind of in this nascent period of your, your, your learning career um of learning and so um i'm going to share my screen i want to see if i can do this this could be interesting Let's take a look. um okay okay let's do this um share right. screen all right and while aaron's doing that too um packaging design i don't know if any um uh, i'm just curious too how many guys after are are also packaging or, or seriously considering maybe packaging design as a field because I know that this is the first year we're taking that course and there might be some of us that are like oh yeah I want to do packaging design maybe professionally um, as an option so okay so we have some like certainty so we have like a blend it looks like 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 I like packaging I like branding um, possibly so I wanted to kind of um, gauge those folks in the class as well. So because you have so many uh, sort of this hybrid, how are you structuring your course and what's, what sort of projects are you sort of guiding your team with here or the students? So in, um, so what we do is we, it's almost kind of like two separate courses happening at the same time, what well, is, but in digital illustration, we're doing um, theory. So we started off heavy in, in uh, principles of design. Then we got into a uh, pen tool and understanding like the pen tool technique, which um, leads us into like more advanced technique. And we're about to embark into like uh, t-shirt uh, design, um, movie poster, um, which also leads to uh, branding or logo. 
-hmm. So that's kind of like our final project. So I kind of start off sort of broad and then eventually we kind of finish off with the, with the logo, which is the mark. So I kind of start sort of um, going from like complex to simple, 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 to like more simple, single mark symbolic. I felt like that sort of um, c continuum helps uh, with the classes. And I found that the quality um, was there because it took, it took the weight off of technique or technical skill and, and kind of allowed for more theory to be applied. Mm. So we're in the sort of like t-shirt design, you know, principles of design and, and it's sort of more composition, more layout uh, related. So, um, but we have done like an um, in-depth analysis of what are the principles of design? What makes a design successful? How does this look really good? How do we know it looks good? How do we articulate and write about that? So we've done, we've also done that as well. Um, and that's for digital illustration. Um, for the packaging design course, it's really been kind of almost similar following to like what Do Good Work does, which is kind of like, okay, we, we're gonna select a project, uh, product and um, whatever that product is, we're gonna do an analysis of, the, of its existing or, or its competitors. And we're gonna determine whether or not we, um, what, where there's improvement. And then we're going to basically either develop the brand if it's a new package, new product, or we're going to redesign the brand if it needs to be redesigned and uh, eventually go through multiple iterations until we can um, get the container and get the, the packaging formulated and then ultimately do that. So it's, it's, a, it's a complete opposite where we actually start with research and then we go deeper into like the nuances of, uh, of, the, of the package. But it starts with research and strategy, the creative discovery, um, very similar to what you're doing there. I, and I did look a little bit at other um, um, curriculums and they were just too complex um, because there's so much that you could do. They're designed for a year. We, we only have a semester. So um, what, what I, my insight was is that do good work really got to the point and really showed like those higher level like markers that you hit in projects. And I'm like, this is really good for a term 20 week um, class. It gets right to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it, it was helpful for me because to do two courses simultaneously is a, is a challenge. Um, so, so, you know, I'm actually making recommendations to the college to possibly split them up for next semester and have them be their own standalones mm -hmm. because the pilot ended up being proof that we really do need to split up the, the two courses and we really do need to have their own sort of mock-up. So I've been definitely working double time, I would say, and um, pre-recording and doing hybrids. Like there's literally, I'm like, I'm doing like pre-recordings. Okay, watch this guys. I'm working live here. I'm switching over there. I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I gotta get Aaron in here because uh, I wanna make sure at least, you know, we're doing justice to your to your method. And, uh, and I wanna give you credit for it too. I totally wanna, you know, say thank you for, for, for doing what you're doing because it's saving me for, and helping our students at the same time. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. So I guess I vented there for a yeah, second, I mean, but sorry. <laughs> yeah, now, um, it's been a while since we put out a video. Um, I, I've been working from, I'm in my house right now. I, I, you know, probably like a lot of you, I've been sort of cooped up in my house for the last over a year now. And so to do videos has been super challenging because uh, we do it, it's very collaborative. We do it as a team and we're all kind of disbanded and a lot of us are working from home. Some are now back in the office, but uh, because of that, coupled with the fact that we actually are operating a business, it's been really challenging to sort of be able to put, develop content, shoot it, edit, and so forth. So we've just been focusing the last year on just trying to survive and uh, you know take care of our clients. And But I, I do see light at the end of the tunnel here. I, I, I got my Johnson & Johnson shot, so one shot or so I'm, I'm good to go, and the staff there slowly getting their shots. So we'll be back in our our environment, um, which we're really thriving. And then we're going to start putting out content again, because we, we have a ton of projects to share. And, and maybe at the, the end of, towards the end of this, I'll share some stuff we've been working on, perhaps just a little bit of eye candy if you want it. Sure. But I think what I, I'd like to start is I want to maybe just go over like, I think it's, it all, everything goes back to foundation. And and this is something I really learned because I, I didn't always focus on foundation early on. I was always focused on the prize. And so 
Um, I'm gonna put, this is a deck I put together. Let's see if it works. Um, start sharing screen will stop other computers sound share. So I'm gonna try this, it says continue. Okay, so I'm gonna see. Mm -hmm. It's working. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can do this. Great. Yeah, everyone can see this okay? Rooted in culture? Yes, okay. sir. Cool, all right. So um, this is a deck I put together a couple of years ago, but I think it'd be really helpful um, for, I get any curriculum, but I think as you start as fledgling uh, creatives, um, I think there's a, these are the things that I wish I knew when I was in my 20s um, that I wanna share with you. But everything goes back to what I consider sort of rooted in culture. And I think I, I put such a strong emphasis on culture in my business. And, and the reason for that is, I think there's a certain intimacy, there's a certain knowledge that we, we obtain when we are focused on culture. I think it, 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 it sort of directs our perspective on how we see things. Um, I think a lot of our knowledge is rooted in our surroundings and our culture. So it's really important that I, we focus on our surroundings. Um, in order to sort of give you a sense of how I think and sort of the culture that I like to nurture, I think it goes back to your history because I think so much is, is through your life experiences. Um, and so I'm gonna go way back. This I'm the guy on the right. Um, and then my brother, he's just 11 months older than me. This is back in 1970. Um, so, I grew up in Venice, California. Uh, in 1970, I was born and my mom was, uh, she's the woman there on the left. She was only 16 years old when she um, had me. So she was 15 when she had my brother who's one year older than me. So I can't, I'm, I'm 50 years old and I have a two year old son and it's like, he's a lot to deal with. And I can't imagine someone who's 16 years old. She's just a kid trying to raise two young boys and so this was the life that I was brought up in. Um, and that's my dad there with the really long hair and that sort of, he converted an ice cream truck into a, a, an RV and we would travel up and down the beach and surf. And, um, but we didn't have, for me, this, my life was, was awesome. Like, but we probably didn't have two nickels to rub together growing up. And so um, my mom bounced around a lot. Um, I later found out in life that she and my dad were never actually married. Um, I always assumed they were married, but they were never married. And she, to this day, I think she's on her seventh marriage. And so growing up, it seemed like every year we were in a different school and we were bouncing around quite a bit. Um, I think where we finally started to settle down when I was in fifth grade, we, we ended up in uh, Montana, which is um, north of here. I'm not sure if anyone has ever been to Montana. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and I think that's where I started to grow some roots and started to settle in. Uh, the town that I grew up in is called Geraldine. It, it has a town of 300 people. Um, so in my class, there was 10 students in my graduating class. So it puts some perspective on like how big things are. It's all relative. Um, but what was great about growing up in a small town is like everybody knew everyone. Everyone knew the dog walking down the street. Everyone knew the name of the dog. Everyone knew what everyone's business was. And so community was such uh, an ingrained part of um, my upbringing. Um, and it was so important to us to have like this intimacy with everyone around you. And it was just because of my culture that I was, I was brought up in. Um, this is my, is my father, uh, he was a farmer. And if you guys haven't figured this out yet, this is how I got the name for my, my business. It was really an homage to my dad because I, I think so much of what I learned was um, from my father. And so I named my business Farm Design after him. What, what I learned from him in a very early age was uh, hard work and work ethics it was really, it was important for his livelihood because in order for the farm to survive, you had to put in, roll your sleeve up and do a lot of hard work. And so hard work was, um, um, was nothing new to us. And it was something that we had to do on a daily basis. Um, and we learned so much from that. And I knew our livelihood was based on the success of farming. And so 
we were in agriculture, so we would grow crops like uh, agri um, alfalfa, oats, and barley. And at an early age, I always focused on the crops. On and sometimes uh, there would be a, a hailstorm and it would wipe out our crops, decimate our crops. Sometimes there would be um, this sort of a bunch of grasshoppers would come through, and the insects would just like eat all your crops up. And so, to me, I knew the importance of the crop. Was, was necessary for us to survive. And so I would ask my dad, like, how are our crops doing? Like, they, they look decimated this year. And my father always told us, like, it's, it's, it's to feed the soil and not the plant. And he'd always say, don't worry about the crops. You have to worry about um, nurturing the foundation, the soil. And that's all you can control. That's all you can manage. And when you focus on the foundation, in the long term, you're going to be fine. So don't focus on necessarily what's above the ground, which oftentimes we will do. We get sort of caught up in shiny objects or, you know, um, driving that nice car or wanting to that, that, that dream job because it, you think you're going to make X amount of money. Um, it's really about what's below what you can't see is what you guys should be focusing on. And I, I, I wish I knew this when I was in my 20s and I later learned it and I'm still learning this is like, all of my effort and energy is focused on um, nurturing the soil to build something stronger for the future. And so that's what I'm constantly focusing on. Um, I boiled it down to like, what is the, 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 the foundation? Like, what are those things that help me grow? And here's some key things that um, allowed me to sort of see growth is like having a growth mindset. When, what that means is, when growing up, I, we, we were really poor and we never had the nice shoes like all the other kids had. Uh, we drove a beat up pickup truck. Uh, we didn't have those things. And I always felt like that's all that was I should have. Like this, this is what my life is and that I didn't deserve things that were better than that because that was the surroundings that I, I lived in. That was my environment. And so I never believed I, I deserved much more than that. And as I got older and I realized that I can control um, my destination by having a growth mindset, allowing myself to believe that I can become anything I want. I just got to put in the time and effort and that allow me to like have an infinite possibility of what I can become and what, what is important to me. So I think a growth mindset is, is, is a really a cornerstone to nurturing your foundation. I encourage all of you to really sort of settle in on a growth mindset as opposed to something that is fixed. Um, I used to work by myself a lot um, when I started my career. And I, I kind of hit a ceiling really early in my career because of that. And it wasn't until I started collaborating with other designers, um, other individuals um, like-minded that were willing to challenge me to teach me things is when I really started to grow as well. So I think foundationally, being really open to collaborating with other people, I think is, is important. Um, getting uncomfortable is, is a really important component to be able to grow is I think um, you're able to grow when there's sort of, um, when it's uncomfortable, it pushes you to learn things. It pushes you to adjust and adapt. And I think that's how you learn new things. And so part of that is you got to get out of your comfort zone. Um, and so, that was one thing that I, I, to this day, I always do things that are hard. And because I know when I, when I strive for things that are hard, I'm going to learn something through it. When I do the easy things, I don't learn as much. Um, and they're too easy. Um, so I'm always trying to do things that make me uncomfortable, that are difficult. And I get so much more out of it. It's much, so much more fulfilling to me when I do that. And I think the, the last thing here is having a vision. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper in that. And I think having a vision is something that really becomes that North Star for you guys and really pulls you to, um, I think, the possibilities and your goals. Um, so I talked about sort of a fixed mindset early on. When I started my career, which was I was in my mid-20s after I graduated college, um, I did cut my teeth learn um, as a creative director at an agency. And I, shortly thereafter, I thought I knew everything. And so I started my own business and I worked out of a spare bedroom in my house. 
and it was just me. And you, you can imagine I wake up and I walk into this room and I would just toil away at this computer uh, day in and day night. Um, and it was just me, it was a solopreneur, just uh, thinking that I was really God's gift to the graphic design. And I uh, thought, you know, I knew everything. Um, and I had some early success or early in my career, but I had a fixed mindset because I felt like this is, this is it. This is what I need to do. And this is, this is all I need to do. Um, what I learned really early on that is like, I was just a, a small plant in a small pot. And I, I really couldn't really grow because I put way too many parameters. I put too many limitations. I didn't allow myself to have a bigger vision. And so I think it's important to really allow yourselves and believe that sky's the limit. And in order to do that, you have to create room for yourself to grow. And I did not allow myself room to grow and mature as, as a designer, as a man. Um, and so I started to break down those walls um, figuratively and literally. And because of that, I, I, it's sort of, I'm really sort of time warp here. It allowed me to get to what I started to find success and fulfillment in life is through practicing a lot of those things that I just shared with you, which were all really foundational, which lead me to sort of where we are today. And I think it also is going to help guide us in where we are tomorrow and allows me to sort of go from that, just that small little, uh, you know, business as a solopreneur working out of a spare bedroom in my apartment into building this really dynamic team of individuals and building a business that really attracts really sophisticated and exciting projects and clients. And that's how I was able to really grow farm design is through a lot of those practices that I shared that were all really foundational. So today we're, uh, we're expanded. Now we're in this large building here um, where we are able to practice our craft and we do it in all of those things I was mentioning earlier. It's like, we're very collaborative. Like um, we challenge each other and we always believe like we can be better by challenging and, and accepting that there's uh, so much more to learn. And that's part of that growth mindset, um, being collaborative, working together. Um, and when I talk about building a bigger pot, it's sort of like this, that we, we, I created a, a larger space for us to sort of spread our legs and grow our roots and, and really just, just grow all together. And then having a like-minded vision with everyone allows everyone to sort of move in a, sort of as a pack down a certain direction. And I think that has been sort of a lot of the successes that got me to where we are today as a branding agency, which is called Farm Design. And we do a lot of a lot of work that is, when I talk about commercial art, it's it's a lot of stuff that you guys are probably very familiar with. And, and, and this is a consumer packaged goods or CPG as we like to call it. Um, this was a client we had, and this is, this is a collaboration of working with photographers, working with illustrators, working with designers, and sort of really augmenting and sort of like cobbling all of everyone's sort of superpowers together to create one solution for our client. So this was a collaboration of, I think, five or six individuals. Um, but we do a lot of these things, and it allows us to sort of branch out and do, I think what's so great about graphic design and branding is it's not one dimensional. Like every client, every project is new, it's challenging um, um, and allows us to sort of try to solve big problems for our clients. And I think that's the thing that really gets us out of bed at, is to be able to solve something to help someone else succeed. Um, but there's never one project that is just like the other. And I think that is the thing that um, keeps it really dynamic, dynamic and exciting. So you can see we do a lot of consumer packaged goods. Um, we also now sort of branched into what we call sort of hospitality. So we do a lot of restaurant branding as well. Um, we're now getting to uh, doing uh, hotels, which is building a lot of sort of brand touch points and brand artifacts that really allow um, uh, a product, an organization or a service to really have a, a vi um, um, a face, a voice, and a story to really sort of um, accelerate and propel their, their brand story. Well, that's what we do now. And I think some of the key things I've learned through the course of going from there to now and what I, I, I'm projecting moving forward is, is you have to be 
able to adjust and adapt. And I think part of like where we're in, like with COVID is something that we all have to do. You're forced, like a lot of us have to be reactive to what COVID has brought to us. But I want us to be not just reactive, but I want us to be proactive in our ability to constantly grow and learn. And so I think it's a simple rule is just evolve or die. And I say that because when I graduated college, we had these things called portfolios that look like this. And I don't know if any of you guys, it was like a leather bound folio thing and you just stick all of your work in it. And this is how I got work um, back in the nineties is I would pound the pavement. I would stick my work in here and I would, I would set up a meeting and I would open this thing up on the desk and this thing would like just plop over the desk and it was super messy. Uh, it just, it was cumbersome. I only had one of these. And so um, if the, the client said, can you leave your portfolio here? I'd like to share with other people. Then I no longer had something to share with the next meeting. So I had to wait until they gave me my portfolio back. So everything was in this thing, but it was just, it was one item. And if I didn't evolve or evolve, I would be out of business. I would no longer, I would not be sustainable today. And as we know today, we have technology. And, and I say this, when I started, we didn't, we didn't have uh, email. We didn't have the internet in the early nineties. Uh, it was just a, a, a really fledgling thing. Um, but with technology, I think that's how you can cast this net that is becomes global. So instead of me pounding the pavement and doing one by one, I had to evolve and sort of get out of this archaic um, form and then convert into something that is more here and now. And today it's now digital. So uh, what's great about digital is you can put your, your work, your voice, your brand, your story out there and people will come. And so you're gonna attract the right type of people, but you have to build something and you have to put it out there. And this is how we currently market ourselves is through, you know, uh, first of all, it was website. And now it's like social media has become a really big component to, to marketing. And, and now it's sort of like videos and sort of like doing YouTube and TikToks. Like it's just, there's, there's just become more and more dynamic and there's more and more sort of channels and uh, ways of delivering your, your story. And I think it's important to be in touch with that and be willing and able to, to adapt. Otherwise, you will be non-existent. There is this story I want to share with you guys. And I, and I want to share it with you because I think this is something that I was a super chicken at one point. And I'm telling all of you is don't be a super chicken. And a lot of you are like, what is a super chicken? Like, I didn't know what this was, but I, I heard this story about this guy, his name's William Muir. Uh, he was a professor at uh, Purdue University. And he was doing some field research at farms to test productivity of uh, livestock. And so in his research, he thought it would be wise. Uh, so uh, he took, he went to this farm and that had chickens. And so he started to notice that certain chickens were more productive than other chickens. And so it's made a lot of sense to him that he would take this select group of chickens who are high yield of eggs and put them in their own chicken coop. And then these other underperforming chickens he would put in another coop. And then he would monitor them and see how they produced, like if their, their yield would go up in terms of um, hatching eggs. So he did three cycles of this. Um, and what he started to notice is in the sort of the, the superior chickens that were producing uh, a high yield of eggs is slowly by slowly, they were pecking themselves to death. And they started to look like this and their productivity went dramatically down. And what he did notice with the other group of chickens, the, the B class, the ones that weren't producing initially, now were thriving. So they, they walked around with a strut, their plumage and their feathers were much better than the, the, pre, the other uh, study group and their productivity went way up. And so what do we learn from this? And what he discovered is that the super chickens, the one that he thought were gonna perform the best, 
is they were pecking themselves to death. And what they, he discovered is that their success was predicated on, on sort of reducing the success of others. And so whereas the other group, they worked together, they were harmonious, they weren't trying to step on each other, they weren't trying to be better than everyone, they worked together as a group. And so when I heard this study, I realized I was a super chicken. I realized that I was the guy that was just trying to beat everybody because I wanted to be the best. And I realized I was not getting ahead and I was not helping anyone around me. And so that's when I realized I need to work with others. I need to collaborate. I need to be part of a tribe that we can all learn and grow together. And, and so when I hire designers now at my company, I look for individuals who are going to be willing to collaborate and work together because I know that in the long term, they're going to be better designers. We're all going to be better together and we're going to produce better work. Um, and through my 20 years as a business um, owner, I've had hired super chickens and I've had to let them go because I started to realize how uh, they would suppress the success of others um, for their better gain. And so I encourage you to think I think it's important to try to improve yourself, but I think you can improve yourself through um, the support of others. And I think that's really important. Um, talk about collaboration. I think that's also part, uh, stems from that as well. It's like you guys, there's like 22 of you here and I know it's a little bit harder to connect, but, um, but I think what's so important is when I was a solopreneur working in that, that little office, um, I thought I knew everything. And I felt like, you know, uh, I was just going to practice what was in my head. And when I started collaborating and working with others, I realized really quickly that I didn't know that much at all. And so that was really um, uh, eye-opening for me. And so I've implemented this this mantra for me is like, I, I really believe I don't know that much. And that allows me to be really curious and want to learn and grow constantly. Um, and I think that's through collaboration. I want to talk about something that I didn't have. And I think is super important um, in your ability to be successful is, is to have a vision. It's, it's not highlighted, it's at the bottom. Um, and I think why this is important is I think when you have a fixed mindset, you think that everything is like set in front of you. It is what it is. But I think having a vision and having something greater and you try to achieve something, uh, a lot, I believe you can get there. But in order to get there, you have to have that vision, that, that, that goal um, that you strive for. And I think the reason why having a vision works is because your brain is programmed um, to seek out information. It's like this, um, it's like a supercomputer, but we are sort of bombarded with stimulus every day, sight, smell, sounds, and our brain cannot possibly process everything. We would go insane. And so there's this, there's this um, part of our brain called the thalamus that sort of filters information. And when we have a vision, and sometimes they say, write something down, or if you envision you wanna have that dream house to like take that clip out of a magazine and post it up on your wall. Those are things that are vision things for you sometimes, but I think you have to do something tangible um, where you have to write something down. You have to get it beyond what's in your head. You have to make it um, visible for you. So that's where cork boards with a vision board is really important. And reason why that happens is your brain will start to focus on what's important to you. So, as an example, like if you go to a movie theater um, and if you're really immersed in that story, that movie that's on the screen, your brain will really focus in on what's happening there. You become immersed in it. What it does start to filter out because that's what's important to you. What it starts to filter out is a lot of the other things that are not important to you at that particular time. And it may be the rustling of a, of a candy bar wrapper, and maybe the worrying of the air conditioning unit in the building. It starts to focus those things out to allow you to focus on what's important to you. And Miguel and I were talking about, we're, we're both fathers now. And so when I was about to have a kid, 
for the first time in my life, I'm like, I, I gotta, I think I need to get like a stroller, but I didn't know anything about baby strollers because I never had a kid before. So all of a sudden, like strollers were like really important to me. And there were certain brands that started to pop up. And all of a sudden, when I'm walking down the street or driving down the street, I would see every stroller that was going down the street. And I'd be like, oh my God, that's that's a certain brand. Or I like that that's a, it has three wheels. I would start to notice all those things. And that's because it became important to me. It was a vision thing for me at that time. And so my brain started to filter out all that stuff and allow me to focus on what was important to me. And at that time was baby strollers. So what does this mean for you guys is I'm asking you and, or, or enlightening you to say, try to figure out what is important to you. What do you want to achieve in your life? And I believe you can achieve that by first allowing that to be a vision for yourself. Write it down, tell someone, um, make it public. And because of that, your brain is going to start to figure out what are distractions and, and sort of um, guard that guard you from those. And it'll start to look for opportunities that help you get to that vision. But if you don't have a vision, your brain doesn't know what to focus on. Uh, Steve Jobs, uh, I love this quote. He said, if you're working on something exciting, um, whoops, sorry. The, your guys' window is blocking my... If you're working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. And so I'm constantly like putting, be hyper-focused on what's important to me as a father, what's important to me as a business owner, what's important to me in terms of my craft to be a, a graphic designer. And so because of all of those, those visions and goals that I have in my life, I'm constantly looking for opportunities. I'm constantly sort of um, pushing away distractions that will get in my way of my ability to um, achieve those things. Um, but I think it's important to have that vision and things will be a lot easier for you. So I think those are some, there's a lot more here, um, but I wanted to stop there for a moment. Um, let me, how do we get out of this? I'm trying to find my cursor, I apologize. So I'm going to stop there for a moment. And we'll see where this takes us. But these are some like foundational things that allowed me um, to like move down a different trajectory in my life, uh, not only as a, as a graphic designer, but as I guess a better human being is through a lot of this foundational, um, focusing on foundation and focusing on things that allow me to sort of um, scaffold my knowledge into uh, things that allow me to see certain levels of success. And success for everyone is different. So you have to understand what, what is successful for you and define what that is. And so it's different for everyone. Uh, oh, I just get out of it. Okay. So, yeah. So I guess I'm going to open it up to like, if you guys have any questions or want to share anything, and then uh, maybe that sort of like segue into maybe another topic or maybe sharing something else. Um, well, um, well I'm, I'll, I'll give folks a couple of seconds there. So I think Ashley, you had a question. I just saw you unmute. Yes. Um, right, go for it. Well, I already told you this professor, but um, I am in the running for a job position at my work. I work at, at Ikea. And um, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been shadowing and um, kind of training with the graphic uh, communications uh, coworker in, in my store. And he just recently said that he's leaving and that, so basically I'm in the running for it, but I don't have, I wouldn't say I'm fully quali qualified for it yet because this is my second graphic design class that I've ever taken. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering um, what's some advice you would give or, or, or maybe something that might beef up my portfolio that, uh, uh, that would give me better standing for getting the job. So you haven't got the job just yet, but no, no, the job's not even posted yet. They just let me know, like the main manager has talked to me already about it. And then so has the, the, the guy I was training with. Yeah. I think when they're hiring, they, they're looking for qualified candidates. And so mm -hmm. 
I don't know what the criteria is for what they're looking for. And so you need to present something to them that starts to give them confidence in demonstrating that you meet some of those criteria. And so you may not be there right now and mm -hmm. that's perfectly fine. Uh, like when I hire people, like I have this huge wish list of like, I'm looking for this Yoda type designer mm -hmm. that, you know, is a ninja at night, but I might not get all of those things. He might be a brown belt and, you know, he doesn't even know, like, so that's fine. So they're looking for you to check a bunch of boxes, but you don't have to be all those things. I think the most important thing that I look for when I'm interviewing someone is the person themselves not their body of work. It's, does that person, are they eager? Um, does that person demonstrate the, the capacity and willingness to learn and grow? Because I can mentor them, I can help them grow, but I can't help and mentor someone who doesn't have the willingness or eagerness to grow. So it does, you don't have to come in fully equipped with mm -hmm. all the bells and whistles in the full portfolio. It, that helps, but I think if you can demonstrate your eagerness and willingness um, to contribute and solve problems, um, you will be, you will show more value. And I think that's what you want to demonstrate is the value that you can bring to that company. Um, I think that's a start. And if you don't get it, then you're going to have experience on, you're going to build that portfolio or whatever you have, and that's going to you one step closer to that next job. And then you're going to have that to build off and it's called scaffolding. So you're going to constantly have that baseline to grow and, and it's going to improve and improve. And eventually it's going to, you're going to knock it out of the park. So you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. so take this as an opportunity. Um, and, and if you don't get it, it's not failure. It's allowing you to sort of learn and grow. And there may be another opportunity, but I think you're, you're doing what is necessary. Um, yeah. So I, I think you, you see an opportunity there mm -hmm. and you're acting on it. And that, that's what's really key. Yeah, I got to shoot my shot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, I, and I know you emailed me about that, Ash, but um, just to kind of piggyback what Aaron was saying, um, I had a similar situation, um, like maybe right, right after college, I think it was. And, and yeah, I had a lot of energy, right? I was, and he told me, but your book is not good. And I'm like, oh man, but he's like, well, you got so much good energy and enthusiasm. It's like, I really wouldn't mind working with you. And I think he took an extra day or two to decide because he's like, I can't decide. I need another day or two. And I was like, okay, this is a good sign. But in the end, that person, he did hire the person that had a better book. But what I realized was, is that personality didn't matter. And if it was enough to make this person think twice over the person with the better work, then being someone that you can, like Aaron said, collaborate with and you're, and you can, we're looking at more than just the book, like we're, or your portfolio. We're looking at, can I work with this person? Can I sit for eight or more hours a day and work with this person? And Hey, I was hungry and I was flexible. And in the, and when I didn't get it, was I bummed out? Yeah. Um, but it, I got way more hungry to do better for the next one. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to, if I'm this close, I know I'm going to get it when I, when, the, when the next opportunity arises. So um, it's just, it's just, you just never know. You just never, uh, never know. So hopefully that'll be an encouragement to you. I think when potential designers come to me, they have their portfolio, like on, um, like on an iPad or whatever form they have. And they sit down and they think like they immediately turn on their iPad or their computer. They want to show it to me. For me, I want to like, I want to get to know who you are first. And so I'll be like, what do you do on weekends? And they're like, what? what? Like I really <laughs> turn them off. I'm like, because for me, business is about people. And so, and I talk about culture, like I want to hire individuals that uh, will contribute and add sort of depth and complexity to the culture. And, and with a really toxic, bad culture, you're going to have a really bad environment uh, and no one's going to want to work there. You're going to get the wrong people. So for me, it's all really about the culture. And so if I can find the right people, because I say business is about people that I want to work with and get excited about, and because I have to see them eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, like they should be fun and interesting and um, they should add to the culture and they should bring value. Um, 
And I'm willing to teach anyone to get them to where I think I ultimately need them, but they have to demonstrate that they have the willingness and the capacity to get there. And I think part of being um, demonstrating you have the willingness or the capacity is you have to be, you have to be vulnerable and allow them to push you, uh, allow you to, um, I have a designer. She, she came from Cal State Northridge as an example. She was an illustra uh, illustration major. She had no graphic design experience. I'm a graphic design, um, we do branding. So we didn't have a lot of need for illustration, um, but Dave Moon, he was, um, I think the chair at the time at Cal State Northridge, he said, Aaron, you gotta meet this person. There's something about her. Like she's an illustrator. I know you're not hiring an illustrator, but just do me a solid interviewer. I'm like, I wasn't looking to hire anyone and I certainly wasn't looking to hire an illustrator, but I like Dave Moon and I said, okay, I will, I will meet her. So I, I met her. Her portfolio had a bunch of illustrations in it and they were great. What I liked about her was like, she had this really effervescent personality. Um, she smiled, she was engaging, uh, she was very articulate. And I said, there's nothing in your book is what I need. It doesn't solve my problems, but I'm really encouraged by who you are. And I said, there's a big gap there and I don't know if you can fill the gap. And what she told me was, I will do anything. I wanna be farm good. And I never heard that term before. And I was like, well, that was interesting. I said, I think in order for you to be farm good is I have to push you really hard to get to where I need you to be. Are you willing to be pushed? And she's like, absolutely. And I needed that person to, to get that um, validation and acceptance to be able to push her, to teach her, to make her feel uncomfortable, to allow her to grow in a way that I needed to get her to feel that position and bring the value that I was looking for. And she is a freaking rock star now. She's been with me five years and she, she does everything. And so of course she does illustrations, but she is the most amazing designer. And, and the reason why she got there is because I pushed the heck out of her. The first year she would, I would teach her stuff and she would design something. And I'd be like, Oh, it's not that good, but I'll tell you why it's not that good. And this is how we can make it better. And she took that, that um, criticism and she went back home and she would practice it and she'd come back the next day on her own time and show me like, like this. And I'd be like, when did you do that? Like work just started 10 minutes ago. She's like, I did it last night. And I knew that she had that something. And then she would proclaim to me that sometimes she would go home and she would cry. And I'm like, oh my God, I made you cry. Like I respect her so much. Like, I can't believe I made you cry. And she's like, I just wanted to get it right. And I knew that I pushed her to a point where she would cry, but she was willing to take that pressure and sort of become stronger. And now I don't have to push her. Like she can guide others. And so those are the type of people I look for. And she didn't have the skill sets when I hired her, but she sure does have it now and she can teach others. So that's just a story that I think you find opportunity, you really want something, uh, you're gonna make a difference. Thank you, I appreciate it. This actually helps me a lot. Um... Because uh, I was talking to the um, the guy that was training me, and he was kind of telling me, "You got to be able to answer the question, um, why do you want the job, and stuff." And I feel like this this conversation with both of you kind of helped me figure that out. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, well, thanks for asking the, the question, Ash. Um, I, a couple of people I saw unmute your mic. So Jess and DJ, did you guys have a question for Aaron? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, may I go ahead? Yeah, Jess, go for it. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for uh, coming to our class tonight. So I would like to preface my question a little bit by uh, explaining that uh, at the beginning of this semester, Mr. Almina, Professor Almina had us do a lot of like reflection and uh, with like our habits, habit forming, habit breaking, things like that. And as uh, creative people, you know, we have to like be these like creative problem solvers. And so like, I would like to know what are some of the things that you or your team do to help you stay focused creatively, to stay pumped, you know, to be continuously uh, creative in a way that helps, you know, like a, a goal be met and things like that. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's an awesome question. And I, I think part of that is, is staying curious um, and also allowing yourself to uh, want to learn and grow and uh, new, uh, achieve new things. 
And so with my team uh, that I've been able to um, gather that help um, nurture the culture of what farm design is, is they all want to learn and grow. And so some have interest in certain aspects of design more than others. And what we do is we're constantly sharing each other's knowledge. And so I've learned so much from these kids. I say kids because they're half my age um, and they share information with each other. So we're, we're constantly encouraging, like if you know something, you learn something to, to share with everyone. And so on Mondays, we have our Monday, what we call a Monday morning meeting. And we go over the task at hand for the week. And we talk about sort of a, sort of a game plan on what we're gonna do during that week. And we always end the meeting with the share. And that share is we all take turns and we share um, something new um, that is inspirational, something that uh, a tool, a, a skill, uh, a, a, just a quick sort of YouTube video, something that we can inspire, learn or grow from. And we're, and that is just one facet of being able to grow. And we do that every, every Monday morning. And that was probably, they say like, what is the highlight every week? They always say like, we love Monday morning meetings. But I think that is a habit is like when we're constantly looking for something and we're constantly wanting to share it, we're constantly doing that beyond Monday mornings. We're doing it throughout the work. We're doing it on Tuesday. We're doing it on weekends. We're always looking for things. Um, and because of technology and how we gain information, it is all right there at our fingertips. Like you just need to Google it. You need to YouTube it. You just, and then you share what these things that you learn and then you can challenge each other. Like, is that truly the best way to do it? I saw this other video or someone else told me this thing and you can have these really constructive um, conversations. And I think that's how you get creative and that's how you grow is like, you're just constantly collaborating and sharing and challenging and, and, and don't take it personally when you get challenged. I think that's what's really important is when people challenge you, um, don't take it personally, take it as an opportunity to sort of um, debate over it. And I think that's how you guys just constructively grow. Absolutely, thanks. I appreciate that so much. Question. Um, and, um, oh man, I, 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 can, I can even share with the input on that too, but um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save it. I'll save the comment there. As uh, that's that's great, uh, a great way to build culture. So that's great that you're doing that at, uh, at your studio, uh, Aaron. Um, DJ, did you have a question that you wanted to share with uh, uh, yeah, with Aaron? Okay, go for it. Um, I was curious if are there any moment where you even now you like tend to get stuck and then you kind of get you can't get lost and like lost in everything like in our creative process getting stuck yeah like is that the question how do you yeah kind of like the career process and like or like just kind of like functioning and like kind of functioning like every day are, are you referring to like yeah. like a creative uh like creatively like there's a area there uh dj um in terms of like like a certain challenge or a design function or feature is that more specific? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Run that. Um, okay. Do you have a specific example, like something you're going through, if you don't mind sharing that, or give me something like a case study that you've experienced recently that sort of like you got into a rut, like to illustrate what you're talking about. Um, kind of like getting stuck on one thing and it's hard to break, it's hard to break loose from, break loose from it. Yeah. I think, I think for us, um, being in a creative rut is a real thing. And, and I think there's a number of fundamental things that we think about and it allows us to avoid these sort of ruts that a lot of people fall into. I think one of them is like, um, I think originality is overrated. Being original is overrated. And what I mean by that is, my dog's trying to contribute as well. When you're designing, illustrating, you're trying to create something when I was really, when I was your guys' age and even in my thirties, 
it was really important. I had a, a certain level of pride. Like I wanted to create something that was, that I could put my name on it. Like I can put my Aaron stamp on it. Like I did that. And part of that is like trying to create something original and creative. And you know what? I just wasn't good enough. Like I just really wasn't creative enough. I wasn't that original. I, I, I didn't have the skills. And, and I think because of trying to be so original and I just didn't have the attributes to sort of accomplish it, it always sort of put me in this place of like, like I might quit or stop because I just wasn't finding success in that. And I think if you let go of trying to be so original, um, I think it frees you so much more. And what I mean by that is I think you, you can learn from the masters. And so there are designers, individuals, uh, people that inspire you. Um, I, I say, learn from the masters, steal from them, have them mentor you. And what I mean by steal from them is like break down what they're doing and try to repurpose that in, in a manner that you can start to craft and make unique for yourself. But it's, it, you have to start there. If you try to create something original for yourself, trust me, you don't know enough to be able to like, create something. You need to start to go through a process. You need to collaborate. You need to learn from people who do it way better than you. And I think that is one aspect that will help you when you sort of bump into a spot. Sometimes I think that's the thing that holds back a lot of designers that I work with is the fact that they're trying to be too unique. And I think that sort of inhibits them from moving forward. I think the other really key thing is to trust the process. So I don't worry about if we're gonna be able to generate uh, a design, a concept, a system for our clients that is gonna uh, move the needle and solve their problem. I don't worry about that because we have a process, steps that logically get, take us one step closer to the end product, which will solve the problem. So I don't worry about what happens at the end. I just focus on the process of being able to get there. And the process is different for everyone. The process is different when you um, paint you know, acrylic or you trying to throw a pot on, on a wheel, or if you're trying to push the pixels um, in Adobe Suite, There's, they're all different. Everyone has different processes, different agencies um, practice different processes. But as long as there are, there's a process and you follow that process and trust it, I think it allows you to get to that, that end space with confidence. But if you're just focusing on that end space and what you need to do, I think that paralyzes a lot of people. And I think it's, um, so we have a process and it took us a while to sort of develop it. And our process is really organic and fluid. It's never rigid. Um, I think our process is really not having a process. It's really having um, a lot of really, um, thoughtful actions is what we do. Um, and so I think when you start to implement some of those things, it frees you from trying to worry so much of trying to like get that thing just right. And I think that's the rut you guys, a lot of people fall into. And I think you can avoid that rut by following the process and don't worry about making it perfect and making it so different. Yeah, and then to add to that, um... DJ, I would say that um, it's, um, it's, I don't know why, but uh, maybe Aaron said, uh, maybe it was Paul Rand. Um, it's like, don't, uh, someone said, don't try to be original, just try to be good. Um, and, and, and it was like, oh, like, just, just aim for what you think is good at you, where you are right now, right? So I think I said this before in class, like, if that's the coolest thing um, on your screen or in your design, if you feel like really good about it then you know it's it's at your you know you're pretty much done right and then if you show it to somebody and they have something to share then you're now you're getting better right but just try to make it look good for where you are now so it's like hey this looks good to me right now and what do you think and if and and i i remember that in my own experience as well where it was like i was mentored had a really great art director i, I thought it was good and then he'll be like, well, you know, and then maybe this, maybe that. And I was like, man, this, like, it sucks. Right. And so eventually, I think it was like four or five years just working um, at, uh, at the company. And it was like, one day it was like, 
there wasn't a, a critique. And it was like, let me say, can I take a look at that file? Or can you show me this? Or um, say, let me, let me play with that. Let me add on to that. And then I started to think, did I just hit a, a new level and not realize it? And then I was like, whoa. And I guess at the end of the day, if I had to like quantify it, it was more just being comfortable and being open to like improving and just trying to, to follow that, like that mantra that I have, which is like, if that's the coolest thing that I see on my screen, if this is the good for what it is right now. And, and there's like Aaron was saying, like, there's someone it, that I can collaborate with that can contribute. Then I know, right. You're not in a bubble. Right. And they're willing to push you and you're willing to kind of take a, you know, take some of the, the, the hard criticisms, but eventually it will make you better. Um, those are, those are valuable, you know, um, tough love. I think it's, it might be called too, right? Like, it's like, I mean, I'll be honest. Like my, I had, I had, you know, my art director sometimes say that like, this is shit. It's like, okay. And the owners would be like, that's kind of harsh. And I'll be like, but I kind of needed to hear that. Right. And, uh, but that's just me for that time. Right. So hopefully that helps. Like just try to, you know, it just do the best that you can at you where you are and be open to those suggestions on how to improve. And then ask yourself like, well, why is it that way? Right. So don't try to be like Aaron says original, like just try to be good. Like, I mean, that's like his whole, you know, site there is do good work. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully that helps. And I don't know if Aaron, <laughs> but that's, that's awesome. kind of, that's my vibe on it. <laughs> um, they say that uh, yeah. you're the average of the five people you hang out with most. Do you remember that saying? Mm -hmm. And so when I first time I heard it, like I was like, oh, who are the five people? Who are my my five closest friends? And I was like, oh yeah, I'm a little bit like that person, a little bit like that person. Yeah. And and so I was kind of like a, an amalgamation of those five people. And so if you want to become really good at something, or if you want to get better. Uh, if you want to be rich, you hang out with rich people. If you want to be a really good designer, you hang out with designers who are better than you. Um, and so it's that sort of mentality is rub shoulders with people who do it better and just will be accepting of the fact that you, you're not as good and you want to learn from them. Um, so yeah, uh, find people, mentors, people better than you, hang out with them. <laughs> And you're going to become better at your craft. And don't worry about those ruts and stuff. Like if you really um, like that, that vision thing, like if, if something is important to you, you'll find a way. So if you want to achieve something, that's going to pull you there. That vision is going to pull you there. So sometimes you're going to hit that speed bump or that rut, and that's fine. Just trust the fact that uh, you're going to continue to move in that direction. Um, and then those ruts really are not that big of a deal. And so, so hopefully DJ that helps, but the, the, this is, yeah, it's really great. And uh, it's a good reminder to like, to all of us, like just hang out with those people that you, that you trying to aspire to be. So, um, um, I want to honor, uh, Aaron's time. So, um, you know, I want, I don't want to go, um, past eight 30, cause I know you got a little one and I know I've been there, done that. And I totally know your time is valuable, Aaron. Um, I, I do have a question myself. I wanted to uh, ask, um, with regards to uh, students and preparation of the of new designers um is are there some things that you feel like you know institutions can do better to prepare students for um you know um not only you know a career in in the field of design but possibly maybe any insights you have for like post-covid and what you're starting, maybe you're noticing something that's going to be different for all our futures. Is there anything that I like, you know, me as a teacher can do to kind of best, better prepare, you know, my students um, for this, you know, this new normal um, as, as designers? Yep. I, I think when Someone said it, and this is something that was never taught to me. Um, I, I always, I got into architecture. I, I mentioned I studied architecture for four years because I love the beautiful forms. I love the buildings, the, the architecture, just 
that I was just enamored by it. And I was uh, always curious about that. And then when I shifted to graphic design, I was just enamored and in love and curious about like logos and um, how colors merge. And, and that was all really quite fascinating. But what is really the difference and the ability to um, provide value to um, your clients or your, um, uh, your employer is to be a problem solver. And I think that is the biggest thing that was never taught to me. Like I just focused in on the beauty, the craft of creating something and understanding that uh, it's not about you, it's about them. So the design is not about me. I was all about like, I want to take the pride of crafting this really beautiful thing, but it was really about serving my client and producing something that ma uh, made their problems go away. In order to do that, we have to be problem solvers. And part of the, the solution is the design that you craft. But I think being a critical thinker is going to allow you to, to ask the questions, the whys, and you know, um, the why you know, we're doing this and, and um, being asked, be able to ask the right questions to the client to understand what is, um, what is the truth. Um, and I think it's really in the questions you ask. And I think that is something I wish I had learned is to be able to be a better listener, um, to process information and to be more of a critical thinker on what I was doing. And then the beautiful pictures um, was just a net result of a lot of the thinking. And so I think being a critical thinker is probably one of the, if you can hone in on that skill, you will be the most valuable person in that organization. I promise you. Um, and I think one of the other key components to um, honing your craft is, is being able to be a good communicator. That's something that they never taught us in school. I, I never learned like how to present. They had critiques and you'd have to like stand up in front of the room and like, this is my logo. And you know, you talk about it, whatever. But you were talking about like, I chose blue because I just like that shade of blue or like whatever. It, you didn't really understand um, the art of communicating. And so I think it's, it's something that everyone, if you can be a good presenter slash communicator, you'll be able to sell anything. And so a lot of times uh, the designers, they'll have, they'll will do critiques and they'll, we'll throw everything up on the wall. And there'll be a lot of designs and we do like, what we call sprints. So they're like really rough concepts. And I will, as a creative director, I'm like, okay, no, 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 maybe no, no, no. And I'm trying to like, cause I have a lot to process. It's the designer that can communicate. I'll be like a no, no, no. And they could say, well, here's my idea. The reason why I got to this is because I'm thinking this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh crap, I never saw that. Tell me more. And I'm like, now I can see the vision of the, the potential and where that can go. And so if it was just purely design, I dismissed it really early. But the fact that that designer could communicate and articulate what their vision was and where they were going with it, I could see that. And it's sort of like, I can see that we can now bridge, close that gap and get there. And so without the ability to communicate, uh, that design would have been lost. And the same goes when you get to the next level, when you're, you have to present to clients the, the, the art and the skill of communicating and engaging and connecting with clients is invaluable and something that was never taught. And I was just thrusted into it because I was a business owner and I was, you know, I was trying to sell logos. And so um, I just learned by trial and error on how to get better at presenting. And so if you can be good, a good presenter, which I think you have to be, you're gonna be really successful as well to, to, to not only engage with your team, uh, your creative director, um, potential clients, um, I think those are invaluable skills that you need to hone in on. Um, so critical thinking and communication are really key. And then you fold that in with whatever you else you're trying to do. You're like, I want to be an illustrator. I want to be a designer. I want to be an accountant. If you can start to do these things, you bring a lot of value to whoever you work for, whether it's uh, you work in-house or you have your set of clients, you're going to bring a lot of value. And when you bring value, you're indispensable. So that's the key. And I learned like, like how much value do you have to bring to someone 
is I always thought like I needed to know so much more than that other person. And the reality is you just need to know that much more. And, and as soon as you share that information, you have value because you shared something they didn't know. And then the next day they're gonna, they wanna learn more. So I wanna always just be a little bit above my client and sharing information. I don't need to have this huge gap. Like I know all this stuff. And so when I heard that, I just told myself, I just always wanna keep learning stuff. And so when I learn something, I'm gonna share with the client and that's gonna be like, oh, I never heard that before. Like, yeah, that, that's fantastic. And that keeps them coming back and it allows me to continue to provide value to them. So that is part of, it's more than just design, it's, it's, it's critical thinking, it's strategy, and then it's the ability to communicate and connect with people and sharing that information. I think that's where uh, you'll be able to move the needle on whatever is important to you. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so it's just coming, and, and that helps me definitely to integrate more of those components for the future. So um, that's, that's super valuable and I appreciate that. And it, and it pretty much works for any industry. Like you said, um, critical thinking, communication will work um, in just about any sphere that you put yourself into. And that's kind of like a liberal arts education, uh, pretty much. So like but, when you have critiques, when you share your work, is to be really involved in that critique. So I know if like, okay, I'm gonna wait for my turn when I have to share my thing, my design, whatever it is. And so I just sit back in the back of the room and I just wait for it's my turn. I think you need to be the person that's really involved and engaged and listen and share what you think you see, how you perceive it. And that's gonna allow you to hone those skills. So don't just wait for it when you're called on or when it's your turn to present what your project is is to be engaged. And I think everyone else around you is going to benefit from your, your perspective. But I think what you're doing is you're, you're honing your skills to communicate and be able to process and articulate what you see. And because there's certain things we look, we see like if we're in this creative field, we oftentimes see something like here's the logo. Um, and we'll be like, in my head, I'm like, I like the logo. And sometimes I'll be like, I, that logo sucks. And then that's all, that's where you leave it. But I think the true skill is being able to like, I like that logo. Why do I like that logo? And then articulate it. I like that logo because it's well balanced because it, it has, it's, it's harmonious or, and I think it really speaks to me because it connects with me on an emotional level or because it's this or that, or it's like, a, it's well balanced. It's something, but when you start to articulate it, you're learning and you're processing why you like it. And also the same as like, that logo sucks. Don't just leave it at there. Say, why does that logo suck? And this can relate to whatever you know, field you're in. Articulate that and be like, I think the logo sucks because um, the balance is off or it's too convoluted or, and I think one way to sort of solve that is to do this. And when you start to do that, that's your, your, in, your, engaging your brain and you become more critical thinking. So don't dismiss it as like, I like it. I, I think it sucks. And it probably does suck. Or it's really great. It's probably great. But be able to articulate and process why. And that is how you hone your skills. In order to do that, you got to speak up in class. Now is the time to do it. And so when you get a job, you're going to be even more prepared and you provide value to your, your, your client. Awesome. So, def so deconstructing and asking the why of things is, is as, a, as the heart of it. So mm -hmm. yeah, turning on our minds and, 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 and instead of just kind of sitting on the wayside as it were, that's awesome, man. Well, I, um, I can't thank you enough, Aaron. I, I feel, uh, I'm always, uh, in, um, inspired, intrigued by every time you speak and, um, and that, and that's why I, I, it was definitely, I'm very, very lucky to, to, to present with you and, and, um, and just to be able to kind of, you know, cross paths. So, um, I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, you could have easily said, no, we haven't spoken in a few years and, and you're here and you're, and you're, and you're, and you did something really, really great. And I uh, can't thank you enough for that. Um, I, it, it's on, truly an honor. And, um, and for the class guys, um, I hope you guys enjoyed it this evening. Um, you know, feel free, you know, put a little thank you to Aaron there, a little emoji clap, whatever it is you feel comfortable with, but, um, please, please, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. I guess I'm a bit of a closet validator. Uh, so I do just want to share appreciation um, and just show some love. And I can't thank you enough, Aaron. Um, if there's anything that you would need from 
us <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, we're here to support, and we really love the work that you're doing, and um, and we really appreciate your heart for just coming in and just sharing sharing some some wisdom. And that's um, and to me, that's invaluable, and I and truly thank you for that. And thank you, and um, thank you to your wife and your son for letting us borrow you for 90 minutes tonight. So. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'm glad you guys showed up. Um, I think you guys are taking steps. Being present, um, I think, is a big part of it. So I, I'm glad like there's so many people, like so many boxes on the screen. Um, um, I think those just it demonstrates you, you have to show up. You have to have intent and you got to practice things. You got to you got to get your elbows and hands dirty and you got to get involved. So um, stay active and you guys are going to be fine. Um, and then have that vision. I, I think that's one of the big things is have a vision and that thing will pull you there. And you gotta be willing to like, just deal with a lot of shit to get there. But if you really care, you're gonna get there. Man, <laughs> it's awesome. Well, thank you, Aaron, I appreciate it. And um, we will uh, definitely connect again, but thank you so much. And um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's, been, it's been truly an honor. So we will see you soon. And go Hondo. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. We'll hopefully we'll make a mark and uh, and get you in. Um, who knows? Maybe a future portfolio review. So uh, we're we're early in our we're early early and young. So we'll we'll do, we're working on a lot of good stuff in the, behind the scenes. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's nice meeting everyone. All right, Aaron. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you again. Bye. Right. Bye. All right, guys. Um, that was awesome. Um. I think we need um, a little break. Does that sound pretty good for everybody? So uh, yeah, I think we need a break. There's a lot to process. So why don't we do, um, what do we say? Like, uh, like 10 minutes? I don't know, do we need 10 or 15? <laughs> I feel like I've processed a lot. So a 15er, yeah, I'm kind of sensing 15 here too. Um, let's go ahead and do a, a 15 minute break, all right? meditate think about and um and when we get back we'll maybe we'll kind of just kind of do a quick little talk and just see how it goes but um yeah uh, you guys are in the presence of some greatness and um and and aaron's got a amazing uh, amazing heart so um gotta give him a big props for that all right 15 minutes it is 8 32 we will connect again at 8 47 and we will see everyone in exactly 15 minutes so We'll see you then, guys. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, the first thing I want to say is uh, thank you guys for um, participating this evening on the, on the, on, I think for some of you guys, this is like your first sort of Zoom, um, sort of like a uh, guest speaker, I guess you could say, or a graphic design speaker. Um, have you guys had uh, speakers visit you guys in your other classes at any point? Um, or is this your first one? Maybe you can give me a little thumbs up emoji. Like, is this like your first ever like in-class speaker um, from a founder of uh, like a regarded uh, studio? All right, that's awesome. Okay, that's cool. Wow, okay. Um, that is a good amount, you know? They don't have, oh, man, they, I wish we have, uh, well, we can now basically, but, you know, uh, traditionally and, you know, in the old days, I guess you could say, you know, when uh, we had classrooms, you know, people had to drive down and do presentations, right? And with technology today, like they could just go into their back room and click a button and they're like right there giving you like valuable information and and i just and and as i'm thinking about it i had a few minutes just to think about it um what you know i mean aaron it okay put it this way the, some of the jobs that this guy charges is like forty five thousand dollars to do like a job right um tens of thousands of dollars is what he charges when it comes to the stuff the stuff that we've been kind of talking about like you need to charge 20 percent. like you know aaron does that right like you don't uh you can't operate uh or you don't pay for rent in Pasadena without charging a good lump sum of, of, for your projects and restaurants. I mean, those are tens of thousands of dollars, right? Um, when they come to you and they're, and they're asking you to do work, like their value is very high up there. Right. I mean, just cap 
I mean, you could just Google how much a restaurant makes, um, you know, per month and you take 20% of that, right? Or 10%, that's a significant chunk of change. And when you have a team of designers, five, six, seven, including yourself, um, you got to be bringing in a good amount of clientele and charging a, a significant amount of money for that to happen. So even though I, I um, like, I would have loved to like, maybe in the future, we'll do that too. Like maybe we'll invite Aaron to talk a little bit more about the business side of things. He really, I just asked him to come in and just, you know, what do you think you would like to share with your students? And, and, and the fact that he just shared with you, like what I wish I knew when I was your age, I think was gold. And that's kind of why I called him. And that's why I knew he was going to bring, bring some gold to it. Um, I know Melina said that uh, you had watched his other video and he had some similar things that he said, but I think tonight he definitely shared some stuff that was not in, in previous interviews. And so um, I think that's, I think that was great. So you guys got something really special out of that. Um, but share with me your thoughts. Um, was there any takeaways, things that you kind of realized tonight that maybe you didn't know before, you know, you can voice it or you can um, just type it in the chat, but I just kind of want to do a little debrief. Like what were some things that he said or some things that you that you're going to, that you kind of take away from tonight. He said a lot, but I'm just kind of curious to know, like, what were some takeaways that you've gotten since technically, you know, you guys were like, this is like your first guest speaker. And so in this field, but any insights, anything that you kind of captured that you didn't realize, um, you can uh, unmute yourself or you could type it in the chat and then go from there. Um, uh, making, learn from making mistakes enriches the person despite, uh, despite being an owner. Oh yeah. That's definitely true, Jesus. So, growing process. Mm -hmm. Working with the team. Yeah, communication and collaboration. Um, it's interesting because, um, you know, the things that Aaron was saying is like a high level leader would normally add, like say those things, right? Like, we, you know, it's all about working together, it's all about communicating. Like, um, you know, uh, it's not, this is somebody that wants to have a long-term business, right? And when you have a, you know, a family to support on top of that, that is, you want to make sure that your business is, is the thing or whatever you're doing to generate income is the thing you want to pursue for quite some time. So, um, so the fact that, you know, Aaron's like, you know, I want to get my business to where it is. And I, and these are the most important things. It's like, it's not cliche. It's it, he truly believes those things. Um, yeah. Mistakes are not bad um, is, is a big one, right? Having vision is key. Um, I totally resonate with, with what you're saying. Um, growing vision. Um, you know, if everyone is growing, am I growing? Those are all key factors. Um, in that process. Um, I think for me, um, when he was talking about like, you know, critical thinking, like teaching students, it's, it's, it trips me out a little bit because he could have said a lot of things like having a portfolio um, or knowing how to generate income or, you know, or, or marketing or this and that. This guy's like, no, can you think and can you talk? Can you critically analyze something and can you communicate what you're critically thinking? And not only that, just the whole like process of like putting it into practice when you when you're not saying something, or you don't have us, or or you're at the table and you're merely observing and you don't say anything. Like, are you giving yourself that practice uh, that internally where you're not showing anyone else what you know, but are you asking yourself the why of things, right? Um, um, though that's like, that's kind of like a life principle, I would say even too, like, why is that, why does it work that way? Why, you know, what makes it work that way? What are the principles of design or, or just asking the, the right questions, you know, like what, you know, why does this company feel like this is a necessity or, or just being able to think strategically, I guess, in, in just in multiple dimensions, right. Just being able to think critically in things in, in various aspects, I think that's a re really big takeaway for me. And I just love the fact that he said that that's something that you really should be engaging with your students. It's like, like critical thinking. It's not, it wasn't even like illustrator this or that. It was like, if they can think and they can communicate and if you, and if you can put it into your projects and, and use that and, and students are asking themselves these questions, these are big things. So I thought that was like, 
awesome that he had mentioned that too, because I did not know that was going to be a factor um, in and of itself. Like I've always known deep down, but it, to hear it from um, a business owner as, um, is, is great. I think it's really refreshing. So I'm glad you guys got some value out of that. A um, couple of things here too. Um, any other insights too, guys, uh, in terms of just like uh, options and things of that sort? Um, normally, um, every semester, at least once a semester, I know last semester could do the COVID and situation, it was a little bit more difficult, but I just thought it was really great that Aaron just stopped by and just kind of spoke and connected. And, um, I'm really happy that he's doing some really cool things and that, um, he had a lot of insight to share. Um, that was really, really cool. And I really do, do like appreciate you guys doing that. Um, out there, Amy, I don't know if you had a question or a thumbs up, but, um, Feel free to uh, put it in there if that's the case, and then we can answer that question for you. But one of the insights that I really liked was um, the fact that you know, don't worry about being unique, especially like at our stage. And then you kind of hammered it home with the, if it's cool to you, like sitting in front of you, then, like, um, would you say then, uh, you know, you're basically learning, and and I guess you. You could see it as like finished, right? Yeah, like if it's like um, just get to where you like wherever you are in your level there, Matt. Um, like get to what you think looks good, and just go aim for that, right? And and then when you get to that point, then share that and see if others you know share in the same way. Um, when you share your work and and people that are a little bit more experienced, a little bit more seasoned, have something to contribute. That's a really powerful thing. Like, I think, I think the fact that um, the most valuable thing is when can, someone can actually give you feedback for your work. Cause sometimes some people don't care, right? They might say, oh, that looks good. Or, oh, okay, you know, no, that doesn't look good, right? But when somebody can actually give you a, a critique or a thoughtful analysis and say, you know what? Um, I like it. Here's why I think that is. I mean, they're like, they're basically like lending you their thought process. And when someone shares how they think about something, especially someone that is more seasoned or more experienced or has a few more years or has a bit more of a, a deeper critical, um, you know, process, that's super valuable because you're getting a peek into their world in terms of how they think about something. Right. Um, so that's like really, really, really helpful. Um, yeah, uh, Amy, you had a comment you said? I don't know if I, I don't know if my earphones are coming in or not. I kind of heard something, but I wasn't sure if, if it was- Can you hear it. me now? Sorry. Oh yeah, we can. Yeah, go, oh, for, okay. it. go for it. So um, a classmate and I were going over like how Aaron was, was going over how him and his team kind of have like Monday meetings and share a bunch of knowledge, basically. Um, I think it would be a great idea if like we kind of did that as a class collectively while we wait like for you to like join us just so that there's not a bunch of like empty, quiet, you know, dead space. I feel like it'll be a great opportunity to do that. I think just so that we can interact more with each other, honestly, I think it would be pretty cool. No, that's a great idea, actually. Um... Man, I never, well, how do you, how does the rest of the class feel about that? Like, okay, chemistry is running a little bit late or, hey, I show up and we allot some time once a week, you know, for the last uh, half of the, the semester. Like, does anyone want to share some insight? Um, you know, Tuesday, you know, first, you know, Tuesday from 6.30 to 7. Okay, um, who wants to share some resources, some insights, uh, something interesting that you may have found, inspirational it could be graphic related, maybe it doesn't have to be necessarily graphic related reading material. Um, you know, how many of you guys uh, would be interested in doing something like that? I mean, maybe a little thumbs up emoji. I saw a few thumbs up that go up there, but um, let's kind of, let's take a tally. Let's see how many of you guys feel like comfortable with that. Okay. Okay. Okay, I see like a good portion of the class um, getting there. Okay, um, I feel like it's the packaging design team too. <laughs> it's like mostly the packaging designers that kind of show that. Um, I have, yeah, we can, 
we could definitely explore that option and and even if it's uh i mean it could be led by packaging too i mean i have no problem with that guys you guys absolutely i have a little bit more time than uh, digital illustration so uh here and there so i have no problem trying that out but i think that's a great suggestion i think we could totally try that out um but yeah, to, just to kind of cultivate that 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 sense of of sharing and collaboration, in a, in the format like Zoom, it can be a little bit challenging, right? I mean, it's easy to just kind of sit and what it, what if we actually used it, that time more constructively, right? So, yeah, I think it's great. Um, I think it's a great idea, Amy, for sure. I like that, and it can be really simple too. Like, here's a link, you know, here's a, here's a link in the chat, and or here's a quick screenshot, boom doesn't have to be something doesn't have to be a massive presentation just like here's like here's a link here's a picture here's a screenshot and i just like this and i just wanted to share it with the class like that's just that's just me um whatever inspires you and and then kind of break that down so yeah i think it's a great i think it's a very cool suggestion yeah we, we can even try rolling it out next tuesday if that's the case so cool youtube video we're working on I'm a, I'm game. I think we can definitely do that. So we can definitely try rolling it out. Cool. I think another thing too um, that I think uh, was important as well was the like I said critical thinking. So coming back to the principles of design, it's like okay, why what what are the principles happening in this image, and just encouraging people to be critical thinkers. I think is also going to be a big factor as well. Um, and then set it up there. Matt is a. Uh, is that a Discord to a specific uh, thing, or is that a Discord you created? Discord for the uh, Graphic Design Club. So I just figured I would share the link. Um, there are some members on there. And yeah, um, it would be cool to share on there as well. You could always just post it and, you know, let it let, let it be seen. Oh, that's a, OK, great. And, and then, Matt, that's right. You're part of the club. Um, I forget, you're, are you founder? Are you president? Are you? Yeah, I'm president this semester. Nice. OK, so that's so, the official Discord. Yeah, that's our Discord. Um, another thing, uh, I really want to do a gallery. Oh, sorry, just like one minute. I really want to do a gallery show. So if anyone has like student work they want to share, you could um, just drop a communication in the Discord and we can make it happen because I think it'd be cool to show, you know, the body of work that uh, real Honda students have been up to during COVID. Okay, so it could be any, so it could be anything related and things of that sort. So it doesn't have to be necessarily completed, but it could be something in the works. Yeah, or like a painting, sculpture, anything like that. Um, you know, we haven't really been seeing each other for like about a year now. So I think just sharing and seeing each other's work would be really influential and cool and see what everyone else was up to. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. And then I'll make sure to sign up for the Discord myself uh, uh, this evening. So uh, make sure you uh, click onto the link, guys, and at least you have it on a tab um, if you're interested in joining and um, be a part of that. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Okay, um, well, I feel like the, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of feel like my mind is loaded. I kind of want to call it a night <laughs> um, a little bit, unless there's like specific questions and things of that sort. Um, just practical next steps. Um, I would say that we have um, for next Tuesday, uh, we'll continue to uh, digital illustration, review the Mickey illustration. So we're going to get that completed. And then basically, we're going to take that drawing of the Mickey and then talk a little bit about developing other artwork where we could find some free resources and design your shirt. And so um, start definitely for between now and next week and maybe think about some interesting t-shirt designs kind of matching a little bit what Matt was saying like and Amy's like if there's anything that you find inspirational uh keep keep a keep a lookout for some graphics maybe if you go out or drive about um just keep your eyes open on t-shirt designs um since we're going to step into that and just be familiar get start getting familiar with just the principles of design for like a t-shirt right what is there a focal point is what you know what is there a framing device happening here um what's the first thing i see right what are the colors why do i see that um what's the messaging what's the font style like really break it down and try to look at it from there um and that's going to be that 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 sort of principles of design for t-shirt design so keep an open eye and if you have a favorite brand maybe start looking at some of the recent designs for that brand um just to get inspired and start to build off of 
of uh, what's going to be like the composition stage for next week. Okay. So we'll do that. But for packaging design, obviously, we are still developing the conceptual directions. Um, I know there's a there's a few of us that still kind of need to share some of the conceptual directions. So um, we'll kick that back up for next week. Um, and we will uh, look at designs, look at directions, and go a little bit deeper um, into what's working, what's not working, and start developing the packaging that much more. Um, uh, we'll probably start talking a little bit, and not next week, but the following week about Adobe Dimension, and uh, and just looking at the containers and the files and how we're going to start building those images, okay, um, and those and those containers. So. Um, if you're still developing your graphics and you have some free time, still continue to do so, um, so that we can take a look at it and start um, sharing a little bit. Maybe next Tuesday we could share some of your um, conceptual directions. Maybe we can maybe we can maximize that time on Tuesday for the first thirty minutes of class. Here's some inspirational stuff. Hey, professor, look, this is what I'm working on right now conceptually. I'm gonna and we'll share with the class, and that'll I think we'll we can maximize our time. Like this is what I like. This is what's inspirational to me. And, um, and we can literally make it like a, like an all class check in on like on what packaging is up to. And I think that'll maximize our time. So we can hit a two for that way. So I could see that being a, another option too, uh, moving forward. Okay. All right. All right, guys. So then that'll be the just practical next steps. Um, then for the following week, uh, you know, it'll be pretty much, you know, push time and just getting all our files ready but we'll take it each week at a each week at a time and then going there if there's um, any questions on assignments feel free to email me um, if you if there's something that's missing um, you could still turn it in a uh, later right um, make some make, make some time to kind of get those updated um, and uploaded um, so then that way you can get those points so if there's something missing a discussion or an activity or exercise that maybe wasn't completed or you're, you're still working on and you want to get uploaded into the site there's still time to get credit for that Okay. All right. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for checking out the presentation. Um, I'll have the video loaded uh, tomorrow um, morning. Uh, so if you want to watch it again, it'll be available, obviously. And if you feel like you want to share it with somebody else that could uh, get some value from that, go for it. Uh, feel free to do that. I'm sure Aaron's going to be okay with us uh, sharing some of those presentations. Okay. Thanks, Professor, for landing the presentation today. It was super inspiring. No, I'm glad, Matt. Um, I'm glad it worked out, and um, hopefully we can, um, you know, get some more people to speak to the group, even to the club, and um, and share some resources. And I really do mean it too. Hopefully, in the future, there could be like a portfolio review type event where we can invite professionals like Aaron, um, and basically have students show portfolios. Um, that does two things. One, you get to see what how the founders and the and the experience. Um, designers and creators uh, would look at your work and make mo modifications. And two, it opens up for a, a job, a possibility or job opportunity or internship. So it, it actually serves two purposes. And at, I, at CSUN, um, we would do that when I was there. Uh, we would do a portfolio review every year, bring in all the professionals, and they would basically connect and say, okay, show me your work, let's talk. And it would be as easy as that. And um, that's kind of like a like a vision I have is to kind of get a our uh, uh, an annual portfolio review where we can just you know do a, a room or a Zoom or a hybrid type uh, thing and then professionals come visit us and basically uh, you get 15, 20 minutes to show your work and they give you feedback. I love this. I love that. I would do this. I would make that. Here, here's my card. Give me a call. I think we might have some work for you. I mean, that's like. That would be like the best situ the best scenario. So that's a that's sort that's a that's a vision of mine that I'm um, slowly working on, and uh, maybe Aaron's part of that process for the future. Who knows? Okay. All right. All right, guys. Have a good night. You are dismissed. Rest up, and we will see you next Tuesday at six thirty. Okay. Be well. We'll see you then. Professor, I have a question. Amy. Yeah. What's up? So I think I completely missed um, like the Mickey Mouse assignment. Um, well, you're packaging, so you're good, Amy. Um, oh. Right. So for for packaging, what we're working on is the illustrations. So um, you're OK in that regard. Um, oh. It's the conceptual direction. So your deck 
basically, you know how you created the conceptual directions and like right. here's different things. Now what you're going to do is create like these Frankensteins or these rough compositions. And what you're going to basically do is try to take your brand, right? I think yours is a, a completely new brand, right? Like a new perfume. Yeah. And you're basically going to kind of just do some rough graphics, right? For like your, you know, two favorite concepts or, um, or, or if you have enough time, maybe all three. So, you know, you'll basically, you know, take the name of your brand, test it out with a font. Um, you'll find, uh, maybe you'll find, you'll create a couple of graphic elements and kind of combine that with the font selection. So you're going to do a Frankenstein of it and build it up, but it's not going to be developed. It's just going to be really rough. So it'll have, you know, this type of background that you kind of quickly cut in. Um, you know, um, it's going to, it's going to have this kind of font. Yeah. It's just a quick, quick, quick render of it. Nothing developed, just, just, a just a, a rough or Frankenstein really rough, rough to see where the opportunities are and if it's going to work or not. Okay. Can I show you what I have really quickly? Yeah, definitely. Were you working on the, are we talking conceptual or do you have some rough, uh, rough concepts that you want to uh, uh, share? So right now I only have one concept, one direction. Um, sure. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see. How do I do this? Uh, there we go. I'm starting to see it now. Uh, so this is the font. This is the first font, and this is the second one. Um, at first, I kind of wanted something like this. Was that isn't as detailed, mm -hmm. but then I found this uh, flower on the right. It's a jasmine flower, and I kind of just did like a a rough. Um, what do you call image trace? Mm -hmm. And then, so I kind of wanted it to be centered somewhere on the top, maybe on the bottom. And then I was messing around, like experimenting with like two of them. And so um, I kind of like put them together and then I got this <laughs> and I kind of lowered the opacity and I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but this is like really rough. I have an image here of like a jasmine flower just for reference, but the colors, the color palette is gonna be really um, subtle and gentle. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, do you ha did, did I see your conceptual direction on screen by any chance? The Google slide floating around anywhere? Um, um, on it there? I can pull it up really quick. Sure. Um, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it is because um, I always like to look back at the at the at my conceptual directions, right? And yeah. just kind of like go back and forth, like you know, and and kind of do like a principles of design. So, is what you're doing a what do we have it like a minimal? Let me take a look. Is this the minimal and romantic, or yeah. it could be honestly either or elegant or minimal and romantic, just because. It has pink in it. Mm -hmm. It's like cursive, kind of like romantic looking. Let's take a look. Out of the two decks, um, which one do you think closely resembles what your rough is? Is it elegant, this slide, or would you? Uh, I was, let's see. Uh, uh, a little bit of both, I would say. Yeah. Um, so let's look at that first one, the um, ele yeah, elegant appearance. So, so in this situation, what I would do here is that um, as I'm looking at this, I'm looking at like, like the commonalities of the art. So like, like, I do agree, you do have a similar line uh, trace there. It's called ambience, right? That was the name of it. Yeah. And so this, the other thing I'm looking at is the font selection. I'm actually looking really closely at those fonts. So where the, is it uh, Carolina or Sherolina? Like, looking at the font selection, like, I would start looking for things like similar to that, the Fiori Vince Camuto, I think it is. Um, though that font selection, I would go very deep into that selection of fonts and see if we could get as close as possible to it, which I think you're you're kind of doing a Fiori sort of inspiration, it looks like for ambience. Um, but I would also look closely at the color options, right? Like I know you did like black on on the pink um and maybe it's just my screen but I'm, but as i'm looking at you know the fonts they're they're really more like a darker pink right or like a mauve or burgundy sort of tone just based on my monitor that's in front yeah. of me 
So I would make a color adjustment and I would look at colors and be like, okay, what are the subtle shifts in color that I can bring into my design? Um, so that's like the first thing that stood out to me was like, oh, is the font um, as close to what I see in my sample here for my conceptual directions? If not, how, how can I find a much more similar font to that, right? That has a little bit more personality. That's kind of my thinking there. The color, it's black, okay. Um, how can I get maybe a darker shade of, not black, but a darker pink or a burgundy? Um, because, um, you know, those, those warm tones like burgundy and pink, those are like within the same sort of, you know, um, color range, I guess you should say. They contrast very nicely uh, versus like black and pink. Um, so I, just based on what I see here in the conceptual direction. And then when it comes to the Floralia, um, yeah, like the, on the lower right of this concept, it is kind of matching a little bit of like what you see here. So, but it's also kind of looking a little bit more like not so much a symmetrical design, but more like an asymmetrical design where they're sort of randomly kind of placed and it's looking more asymmetrical than symmetrical, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, and really at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of typography. Um, the perfume is really the shape of the bottle and then the type and then the color and typography. So color and typography are a really big factor in, in, and also of course the, the treatment of the illustration. But as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, oh, well, like we really should have some contrasting fonts also. So, yeah. you know, um, contrasting sizes, contrasting fonts. So maybe we need to have ambiance and a contrasting font to create, to, to increase the, the, the aesthetic and the, the visual interest of it. Right. Okay. So a lot of perfumes have that contrast of fonts, um, which is, uh, and then that unique form of the bottle and color in addition, of course, to scent, but if we're going to market it, we're going to need to like maximize the font selection, the contrasting sizes of those fonts. Um, in addition to the bottle itself, I felt like the bottle will be the most challenging because it's the last thing, yeah. but, but the typography, the color options, those are going to be really important. So I think you're going in, about it in the right way um, okay. there. In terms of illustration, um, yeah, I think we still need to keep exploring a little bit. Maybe feel free to maybe like, uh, I don't know how comfortable you are with like drawing and sketching, but maybe you could do like a little miniature, miniature drawing just to kind of see how you feel and live trace that. That could be an option too. Yeah, I actually have some, but I don't know um, like where I put them. Okay. Um, you could always like, if you have a screenshot, you can email them over and, and, you know, we could always have like a running email conversation. So um, you could even go in that direction and experiment, but these Frankensteins are really meant to be like rough just to kind of give us an idea if it, if, if it's worth pursuing on, um, further. Yeah. So, um, there's that one. And if I take a look at the other slide for a second, just to kind of get a little visual. Yeah. I really love this packaging here just because it's like a very soft transition to like the lighter box to the darker one. And mm. I wanted to have like three different perfumes in this collection just to have like a variety of them but the main component would be the jasmine flower that's why I decided to kind of like blow it up here and make it like the focal point sort of in a way mm -hmm. um but yeah and then I just looking at the designs of the floor can I take a look at the concepts there um I think what makes this distinctive is the um is like the, again, like the, a couple of different, it's a little bit more iconic as opposed to like rough, uh, like more defined illustration, it looks like. Yeah. So like this one has a little bit more of a defined edge to it, if that makes sense. Um, and looks kind of logo-like, I would say. Whereas the other one is like very typographic and rough, rough illustration, um, like kind of like sketch-like almost. This one is more logo and more color logo and like almost pattern um, and repetition. So like you said here, so pattern, simple, clean color and gradient. So in this one, what we could do for like a separate Frankenstein is to like um, have like a more of a logo, more defined sort of, of graphic, not fully developed, but just kind of logo like in a sense. 
Yeah. And then maybe you can select the specific colors using the, uh, your color picker. You can even even pick up these colors using the eyedropper tool. Quite frankly, like you can, um, huh. you can literally like uh, drag and drop it into your Illustrator and do like an eyedropper to the color. Yeah. So you can eyedrop them in, uh, draw, draw three squares, drag the image in, eyedrop, 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 and you yeah. have your color combo there because there's no there's no uh, there's no copyright for color combination basically. Um, Okay. And then we have some pattern happening here, like you said, so we could even um, maybe do like one or two quick patterns and see what that looks like. Okay. Um, can I show yeah. you really quick on my camera, like the other um, type of spelled out ambience? Like I, 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 I kind of like experimented with the font. Sure. So I'm gonna share. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Uh, were you retrieving? Is it a screenshot or a link that you're gonna retrieve? Or no, it's a, it's literally I have my my notebook here. I'm just gonna like, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So like I don't know if you can see. Yeah, let me let me pin and so I can go a little bit bigger here. Um. Oh, okay. So that's kind of like your logo uh, treatment there. Um. So that's a mark within a logo type. Yeah. And I here. And you like that one there? Oh, because the eye is kind of like there with ambience. So that's the favorite. And can I take a look at the top one there for a second? It looks yeah. a little bit more scripty. Yeah, this is like the cursive version of this one, I think. I just like this one because it's really like clean and simple. And I guess my message I was trying to go with was like ambience means like the character in the room. And since the eye is there, I just thought like the flower should be like the character of or like the focal point of the brand i think that kind of made more sense to me and then it. yeah and this is a, a specific flower i forget is it a jasmine, jasmine it, flower. and so yeah. what is the meaning of the jasmine to you like um, not to anyone else but what what does it represent to you um what makes it metaphorically curious to you i would say um I guess when I was researching, it was one of the most like prominent ingredients in every perfume. It was mm -hmm. like the very, very first one. And so the other two that I had on my Google slide in the conceptual direction, it was like the other two, like the top three basically. And I wanted to just um, use all of them like a separate version of perfume, the same line and kind of just add like maybe like another ingredient or two like I don't know, like orange, like an orange mm -hmm. scent. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I did not know that it was the primary ingredient. So that says a lot. And um, so, so that whole notion of like first, most uh, focal focused primary, right? Like, yeah. like those are like key thoughts um, to kind of keep as you're developing that, right? which makes sense. Like now I see how you're connecting them because there is like a primary tool. I would say, let's make a rough of that. Um, it feels like it, it might be more italic um, and it's and it looks like more of like a modern italic sort of logo type almost mm -hmm. um, or logo really because it's it has the mark inside the logo type. Um, but let's see that. Um, okay. I, I don't know where you go for font selection, the but uh the font okay i like another one called font squirrel have you heard of that one yes um i like font squirrel be, uh, because it's a lot it's more curated and it has it's like selected by designers for designers basically so i would uh definitely um even explore that as well under the under the sans serifs um and see if there's anything there that might look interesting too um the font has a lot it just takes a while to find them and but when you find them it's great versus uh, I feel like Font Scroll has just more curated. It saves me a little bit of time. If you got the time, then hey, Defont and Font Scroll would be even better. So okay. those are a couple of thoughts that I have. Um, I think you're moving in the right direction. I think we definitely need to develop contrasting fonts. So and and really hone in on the font selection. So yeah. so um, like classic typefaces, I think will really help. Like um avant-garde um times new roman um like the classical fonts um 
I think are going to be really key to it because the classic fonts or the serif typefaces are they have history they they have detail yeah um, they have this sense of like high-end luxury or at least in the western world that's what they kind of represent um you know things with detail are often kind of re reminiscent of you know higher value but then that's not necessarily the case either like things can look modern minimalistic and that could be a higher value i think it all depends on who you're targeting at the end of the day right. so um so yeah i would go with a, like those really popular classic typefaces for the for the elegant traditional um and then for the for the minimal and modernist ones definitely um popular uh popular typefaces that are ser sans serif uh serifs or excuse me sans serif um you know could it be a futura um could it be, you know, Helvetica thin, right? Yeah. Um, it could be, um, you know, um, ITC Franklin Gothic thin, italic, right? Um, these are these are very these are these are very um, well regarded uh, sans serif fonts, and they have a place in history. So, like, let's see what they look like in those in those elements. Okay. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, I'm just um, writing notes down. Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So you think a good direction would be like two fonts that kind of are different. So like a, a sans serif and a serif, but like how, how contrasting can they be until they get like, you know, like too harsh? I don't know if you know what I mean. Like, since they're totally different typefaces, I don't want to have them like clashing too hard. Well, um, let me recommend a book that uh, that 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 definitely answers that question. It's called "The Elements of Type of Typographic Style." So um, that's a that's a big one. It's a it's a long read, but there's a specific se section on on um, on uh, contrasting fonts. So um, elements of typographic style is a Somebody has a free PDF? Oh my goodness. If it is, I'll be shocked. Well, is it? Is it? <gasps> oh my God. It is. Oh my gosh. I can't believe it's free here. Um, yeah. Um, oh boy. Oh, you lucked out. Okay. So let me see if I can find the page here. Um, is it searchable? Oh no. Okay. Um, is this it? I think this is it. Elements of typographic style, elements of typographic style. Is it, is it? Alphabetical symbols. Yeah, yes it is. You lucked out. Okay, so he, somebody scanned the book. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, here it is. I literally Google searched it and somebody like picked it up. So, um like these fonts right baskerville helvetica palatino times roman and it's italic choosing and combining type this is a uh, page 49 um there's um there's a lot of good examples here and so the the question is can i go classic versus modern absolutely there's no real like like one way of doing it um, you could contrast two different styles of this of a serif, or you could go serif versus sans serif, right? Yeah. So contrast comes in a lot of different ways. Um, they're not so much rules as they are like guides, and it's up to you if you want to break it, um, which often happens. And and it goes back to like the critical thinking component that Aaron mentioned. It's like, can we, you know, what is the justification and um for today for your for your client and it's a it's a big read but it's definitely worth it so i think from page 49 is there because um this one goes deep into like specimens and things of that sort but let's see if i can if it kind of talks him in there um contrasting fonts i also think uh i want to say that there's a site that i remember seeing that um ah three principles for perfect typeface pairings typographic i think this is it 
I think this may be one of them. Yes, serif send serif. Yeah, they even give you some. Uh... Oh yeah, pick super families, and then contrast them. Perfect. This is this is another one. So I think this is a, a much better, shorter version of the book. <laughs> Um, but that book is worth a read for sure. Um, that's definitely something you want to have like a glass of wine and be awake for uh, to do that. But um, the, the, the short answer is, can I combine modern with classical? Absolutely. Um, and you can definitely even find um, samples online. I, I feel like contrasting typefaces is like a thing where people just kind of put them together and make little posters out of it. So um, you can even look at different um, typefaces there and see how they kind of contrast in and of itself. And designing with contrasting typefaces, there's a lot. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's really the, con for me, I contrast the super families, right? Like the, 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 the really classic popular serif and modern typefaces, and they always look good. Right. Um, so I would start there and make like different arrangements of them, if that makes sense. Um, and go with what instinctively looks good. OK, um, I would definitely uh, start there and, and start building it up. And then sometimes I just like to just look at what's contrasting out there and what people use to contrast and get inspired. And then I add that to the mix, too. So um, these are contrasting colors. Sorry. Uh, um, it's more contrasting the typeface. So um contrasting visual communication there's a lot of content on that so i'll give you this, this google search and then you can kind of take a look at some of the rules there but i think my my rule is the super families i'm always contrasting the the, the well-respected and well-regarded typefaces because they never fail me and then i think once you do enough of them you start to kind of like have a favorite and, and, uh, and popular ones that you keep coming back to time and time again. So that would be my suggestion there to kind of contrast them. So, yeah. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully that helps a little bit. So it's totally cool. And you haven't really taken a typography class yet, have you, right? Um, yeah, I took a typography, typographic design, um, mm -hmm. I think one, six, four. I don't know. I've, I have like three classes under my belt. I'm taking like so many this semester, so. Yeah, it's kind of hard to retrieve everything at one time. Sometimes yeah. you gotta have to like digest it like uh, like once a semester, it almost seems like. Yeah. Um, what, what I, my take, normally what I would take away from contrasting typefaces is super families and, and experiment. So <laughs> um, the link that I gave you number two is worth it, is definitely worth a read. And then probably the third link, which is just looking at stuff that looks cool to you. So um, try both ways, like try some, try some popular fonts, contrast them, right? Yeah. Um, and then try some stuff that just off the cuff looks good to you and you're just curious and they have no meaning or purpose and it's just, and you don't even know where the font is from, you just like the way it looks. Yeah. Um, just try that and then, um, and work off your, just your design eye and your instincts without you know, worrying about the history of it and stuff like that. I kind of go with those two modes in my brain, like, all right, you know, historically, this is what works, but let me just do, let me just go off the cuff and let me just do something that I like and let's see what that yeah. looks like too. Um, Cause you never know what you might hit um, when you go like uh, freestyle basically. So I get um, you. So those two formats uh, always work for me. And then at the end of it, and then at the end, I just kind of compare. I'm like, okay, out of all this, and save everything, right? Like have the more, the better. Um, and be like, all right, well, out of all this, what just, you know, what looks good to me based on everything I know about this project and you'll, and you will gravitate, you know, you'll just start to gravitate towards something that looks good to you. Yeah, totally. So hopefully that'll help there um, with regards to the typefaces and the font. So you're, you're in that mode. So right now um, we're basically doing those Frankensteins and just kind of looking at what's working and that's what we did um, basically on Tuesday. And then, um, and then last week was asynchronous. So we were kind of developing. So we're in that stage. Um, 
Well, and then the, let me go ahead and, and stop the video too. So then we have that. The 